All right, well, why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, so, again, I'm Kevin Quinn, uh, and uh, we're going to do Image Processing 101 here. Uh, the, the goal here is to come up with a straightforward way to, to do your first image. Um, we've, uh, we, we've been having, we've been meeting now for gosh, like three years, three and a half years, uh, and we've kind of touched on this now and then, but we've never really uh, spent, I think, enough time really going through the basics of, of how to get your first image out. Uh, so we wanted to, to walk people through that, uh, so you kind of get over that initial hurdle of, wow, this is really intimidating. Uh, we're going to record this, so and hopefully have it available on Novak's website, uh, but it'll be available somewhere so that people can use it as a resource in the future. So don't feel like you need to, to, to memorize everything that we're going to walk through here, or you know, take notes of, of everything that happens. Hopefully, if you have that and, and looking at the video, it'll, it'll all be fairly self-explanatory. And if not, that's what the, uh, that's what the email list is, uh, is all about. Um, so, the, you know, the challenge I think everybody faces when they first get started on imaging is that uh, you, you, you finally master your gear and you get it out there in the field and you get it all set up and you're, you're taking some nice pictures and you get back home and somebody, somebody says to you, I'm going to borrow this for, you for a second here, Bob, sure. so when, when you say to somebody, how do I process my image? How do I actually turn this into a picture? Somebody says, oh, well, read a 350-page book. <laughs> and once you have mastered that, then you can start processing your images. And so we're not going to do that. <laughs> we're going to try to walk you through some of the, some of the basics. Um, back, I guess back in the early days of digital imaging, uh, there were no 350-page books. And I guess the way people did this is, A, they were brilliant. And uh, B, two or three brilliant people happen to be located in the same geographic area and could help each other out and make it work. Today we have the internet, uh, and uh, so there are, there are still ways to get past having to read the 350 page book. Now, will you get a better result once you've done that and you've, you've learned the techniques, the advanced techniques that are, that, that are in that book? Yeah, definitely. That's why you'll see the image that we're going to work on here today. Uh, the result that we're going to get out of this is not as good as the result that I posted online a few weeks ago of, of the same data. And that's because I spent about you know, 12 hours sitting in front of a computer using a whole bunch of more advanced techniques that we're not going to go through here today. The goal here is learn how to do this the first time around. Um, so we're going to do this two different ways. Uh, the way that I think most of us uh, uh, in the group process photos these days is to use PixInsight. Uh, maybe a little bit of touch up here and there in Photoshop, but the, the majority of it is with PixInsight. The thing about PixInsight is it's about a $250 program, and I know that when everybody goes into this stuff, they think, no, I want to do it for free. So there is a way that you can do it for free. Uh, it takes more work. Uh, and it's not any easier. Uh, I think one of the things that you, you may hear about PixInsight is that it's hard, and definitely it is. On the other hand, the amount of time that you would devote to learning how to process a photo in Deep Sky Stacker, and then how to finish it in Photoshop, to me, that's going to be the same as the amount of time that you learn starting with PixInsight from the ground up. And PixInsight has a lot more tools in it. I mean, a lot more tools. Um, but what we're going to do, since people do have that, you know, I want to do it on the cheap mindset to get started, we're going to show you how to process uh, in Deep Sky Stacker and a, a web available version of Photoshop first. Uh, then we're going to process the same data in PixInsight. You can see that, at least from my perspective, it isn't really any more work in PixInsight. It's just that PixInsight has a zillion buttons and settings and dials on it. You don't need to know most of those buttons and settings and dials. I mean, you get 99% of the benefit of PixInsight by learning 1% of its capabilities. Um, so I mean, it, from my perspective, if you are getting started in imaging and you want to figure out how to do this, it's probably worth investing in PixInsight. You know, $250, if you really get into deep sky imaging, $250 is nothing. 
but we are we will walk through first through uh, Deep Sky Stacker and Photoshop. Um, Deep Sky Stacker is available online. Uh, I just learned yesterday that there is now version four of uh, Deep Sky Stacker, um, and yes, I did download it. So, so I'm going to show you how to use version four. Um, but as near as I can tell, it's for at least for the stuff that I'm doing, it's identical to version three. So I don't well, think you'll see any the, difference. The big thing I saw, I downloaded a, a copy here recently, was it's now 64 bit because I was always running into problems with out of memory when it was processing. Oh, and now that's it's interesting. Now it's 64 bit. Okay, but I, I did notice that yesterday that there are now, there's a 32 bit and a 64 bit version. So the 64 bit then allows it to access more than two gigabytes of memory and it doesn't just when it's about to finish processing it doesn't say whoops out of memory sure. okay so I, you know i never ran into that problem with these stack stacker but that's because i've always had a, a camera with a small chip yeah and, and so it's been, never really been an issue with me but you guys who shoot right. with the slrs and have these giant data files i have heard people say that they ran into problems with the with that running it all running deep sky stacker Okay, good to know. Good to know. I think they also released the source code. Did they? They released yeah. the source code? Yeah, Okay. Okay, that's good. All right, well, but, it, you know, function wise, I haven't really noticed any difference in it. I mean, I didn't, I didn't have to learn anything new to use version 4 over version 3. Right. So, what we'll do is we're going to run through this, this data set. Uh, this is M100. Uh, it's an LRGB data set that I collected over the last, well, actually, I started collecting it two years ago. Uh, it took me a while because of various problems. It took me a while to get the, the last of the data that I wanted to. So I, I think you guys probably saw I posted it a few weeks ago on, on the Novak list. Um, so we're going to use that data set. We'll run it through Deep Sky Stacker, and then we'll show you how to finish it up in uh, Photoshop. Now. Um, I mentioned this when I posted it online. The data set that I posted online is definitely not complete. I think I had five, five images with each filter, LRGB. Um, and probably I had about 400 luminance images and, I don't know, 60 or so for each color. Uh, and there's no way that we would be able to, to process, let, let alone post it on Dropbox. Um, I can't imagine how we could do that. Yeah, Bob. Just out of curiosity, your finished image with, this hun with these hundreds and hundreds of different colored images and the five color five images, how does the result look? Can you tell what that is? I don't know. I, ne I never processed it with the five. So what I did when I posted it online, I, I posted five frames from each channel just so that we can run that through Deep Sky Stacker and you can see how it works. But I also posted a file that had the, the master you know, the, the stacked images, and that was all the data. So, so when we go into Photoshop, it's the, the good stacked data that we're working with rather than five two-minute images. Because I think you might look at the five two-minute images and say, okay, clearly Kevin doesn't know what he's doing. Uh, but uh, so, so yeah, we'll, we'll have good data to work with once we, once we start doing the, the final steps in processing. Now, so Deep Sky Stacker is just a stacking program. You'll see, well, when, when we get a little bit later on, um, you'll see that there, there are some extra things that it does that you could start doing some of the processing with it, but don't. Do, do your processing in Photoshop. It, it really, Deep Sky Stacker is designed to calibrate your stack your images, and that's all. It's not designed for, for, for processing. Uh, so why don't we sit down, and I'll, I guess I'll get started with uh, setting things up, but well, actually, before I do that, uh, we're going to focus on three stages of processing here. Whether we're using Deep Sky Stacker on Photoshop or whether we're doing PixInsight, we're doing things the easy way here. We're not going to do any advanced techniques. The idea is to show people how to run your first set of data through processing and get a result that, that is acceptable to you, that you don't look at and say, this is hopeless, I give up. Uh, we're not going to do anything even remotely advanced. We're not going to do noise reduction. We're not going to do sharpening. We're not going to do masks and, and, and all that sort of stuff. What we're going to do is calibration, which is you know, dumping your, your flats and your darks and your bias frames against your lights. 
We're going to do stacking, which is where everything is lined up and integrated to, to give you, well, to turn your 400 light frames into, into one final image. And then we're going to show you how to stretch uh, that, that image. So we're really just going to focus on these, those three steps, calibration, stacking, and stretching. Um, certainly, after we're done with the presentation, you know, ask all the questions you want uh, about uh, more advanced techniques, and we can definitely talk about those. But I do want to throw those into the, the introductory uh, steps because I can tell you that once you start trying to do noise reduction or sharpening, there's a lot of ways to go wrong, and there's only a few ways to go right. Uh, so it's, it's helpful to know what those are before you really dive too far in and think this, uh, this is going nowhere. All right, so why don't we sit down and we'll start with Deep Sky Stacker. And we'll do, so Deep Sky Stacker does calibration and, as my guess, does stacking. So those are the two things that we'll do. Then once we've got our final images out of Deep, Deep Sky Stacker, we're going to go into Photoshop. And uh, we'll show you how to do the stretching in Photoshop and get your, get your final image out of there. Um, just so I know, for the folks that are here, how many people shoot with a color camera? Okay, that's good. That's, that's pretty much what I expect. How many people use monochrome cameras? Okay. Good. Well, yeah, starting with a color camera is usually the way to go. I mean, a lot of people have DSLRs, and figuring out how to you know, attach your DSLR on top of your scope with a lens, is, that's the way I tell everybody to get started. I didn't do that. I did what I tell people not to do, which is I got the camera and I stuck it right on the back end of my C8, and that is a hard learning curve to climb. That's why I've been doing this since 2006, and it took a while before I got anything that I was even remotely pleased with. Um, all right, well, so let's open up our data in Deep Sky Stacker. Um, just so I know, how many people, did you guys download the data to, and, and have the software to, to follow along? If you don't have it yourself, just look over somebody's shoulder who, who does, and you can get a sense of how this works. Always better to, to, to learn by doing rather than uh, to, to just watch it. Um, but again, you know, this will this will be posted online, so don't feel like you need to memorize every step. <coughs> so this is Deep Sky Stacker four, and like I said, as near as I can tell, it looks exactly the same as Deep Sky Stacker three, um, uh, but uh, apparently it has some new new bells and whistles under the covers to make things work out better. Uh, for you guys, especially with the SLRs. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to load our images in first. And you can see up here in the upper left, there are five different categories of images. Um, you open your lights, uh, Deep Sky Stacker just calls those picture files. So I'll open up my light frames. This is the data set that I had. We're just going to do the luminance frames first. We'll show you why in a minute here. So I open up my five luminance frames. I think you can also drag and drop into uh, Deep Sky Stacker. Um, I'm just going to use the file utility here. So I'll open up my darks now. Got five of those. And again, you know, I like normally I have 75 darks, I have 25 flats. I'm just doing the luminance here. So I'm opening up my flats now. Uh, but here, you know, I'm only doing five of each just to, so everybody can see how this works. Um, so dark flats, how many people, how many people who are imaging now, how many of you guys actually use dark flats? Are you the only one who's, who's using them? Yeah, I used to use dark flats. Well, the reason, the reason that I'm not using them anymore is that PixInsight is telling us not to use dark flats anymore. You don't use dark flats, okay. So, so back in the days when we were taking really long exposures uh, just to get our flats out, um, people would have to put a dark, take a dark especially for that flat. Most people aren't doing that anymore, and I think most of you will find that you don't need to anymore. In Pixon's site, as far as I know, they don't even have a utility to, use to, to calibrate the dark flats anymore. Deep Sky Stepper still has this. So if you do that, uh, you, can, you can use it. Uh, but like I said, I haven't in a while. So my last one here is the offset bias files. Uh, oh, yeah, and I apologize for this, but in the data set that I posted online, for some reason when I was capturing, you can see that these are actually bias frames, but for some reason when I was capturing the bias frames, I was labeling them as darks. 
they are, you can see that they're zero second exposures, so they are actually bias frames despite what I have called them here. And you'll see, since I've told Deep Sky Stacker that the biases, Deep Sky Stacker will recognize them as biases. Before you get too far, you were talking about the dark flats. Yeah. Um, can you, unless this is off track, uh, what's the difference between a dark frame and a dark flat frame? So a, a, a dark, so if you take your lights, you know, say I take a, a five minute exposure of M31, well then I want to take, uh, uh, I want to take flats for it, right? Right. And I want to take darks then to, to put against my, my light frame of M31. So I've taken a five second exposure, or five minute exposure of M31, and I want to usually have a five minute dark uh, that's taken at the same temperature, you know, if you, if you can control the temperature, you know, that's what you want. Yep. So you put that dark against that light. Well, so the thing is here, I've got a flat frame over here too. And if that flat frame is like, you know, took one tenth of a second, then I don't really need a dark to put against that. But for the same reason that I need a dark to put against this light, because the you know, heat built up while I was taking that light frame over that five minutes, right. in theory, heat built up in that flat frame too. So in theory, you need a dark flat to put against it. In practice though, what people have noticed is that um, I, I think this is as cameras have gotten better and, and your, your flats need shorter and shorter exposures. There's really no, and, and, and as your cameras have gotten better at dealing with heat, there really just isn't enough heat building up in that one tenth of a second exposure to need a dark frame matched up against it. But back in the older days when you were shooting, say, a really long dark frame, or more important, when you really couldn't control the temperature of your camera, then people were finding it necessary to use dark flats. How necessary it ever was, I'm not really sure. I think it, it may have been one of those things that, you know, to get that last one-tenth of one percent out of your images, people felt the need to do. Um, but on the other hand, it was pretty easy, so sure, you know, why not? But these days, it does not seem to be necessary anymore. Okay. I haven't noticed anything. Um, so, so we've got then just three sets of, of calibration frames here. We've got our five lights, and then we've got five darks, uh, five flats. You see them listed here under the type. So we've got our we've got our lights here. We've got our darks here. We've got flats, and we've got bias frames. Just processing lumens. Yeah, so, so right now I'm just going to process the luminance, and you'll see why when we, when we add the other colors in, you'll see why I'm doing it this way in Deep Sky Stacker. So now that you've loaded all your files in, you just go over here and click Check All, and you see that all the, all the boxes are active here now. So it, it's got a, all, my, all my frames are ready to go and be used as I, as I stack this. Then you go to Register Check Pictures. And you'll get this dialog box pops up that says register settings. Um, go over here into advanced. This is the only time that you're going to look at anything called advanced in this session today. I don't know why they call it advanced. You really, you really have to do this. Um, what this is going to do is it's going to tell you how many stars Deep Sky Stacker has found in your images. And you want to get enough stars that the stars, that's how this thing aligns. If it sees zero stars, it's not going to align anything for you. It's going to give up. So you want to make sure that it's getting enough stars that it can do an alignment, but not so many stars that it's starting to pick up noise and hot pixels and things like that. This is going to depend on what your camera is like and how big your chip is and how hot it was and things like that. For me, I have to adjust the slider way down over here to like 3%. For you guys who have bigger chips, you know, maybe you're up around 20 or even 30%. You know, but for me to get enough stars, I have to drag it pretty far down. At least if I'm shooting um, in galaxy season, you know, I've got a small chip, I'm shooting a galaxy, and you know, by definition, galaxies are out in the middle of nowhere, they're not in the Milky Way. And so there aren't going to be many stars in that image. So for me, I have to drag that slider way down to get enough stars to stack on. Find the number of stars you have by clicking this button that says Compute Number of Detected Stars. It'll run through your lights. Uh, and here we've got 35 stars, and that's fine. That should work. That'll work out just fine. 
So we'll hit OK, and it starts uh, uh, looking through the frames. But what it's doing on this first run is it's doing the calibrations, and but more important, I think what it's doing is registration. Uh, calibration actually would take longer than that. Uh, so what it's done though is it, it's looked at your lights and it's it's tried to analyze. Okay, what do I have for these lights? How do they match up? How do they compare to each other? And if you go over here in the information that you got back, now it's given a score to each of these frames. And you can see it's it's rated them from what the worst of the five light frames. The worst one is 189, and the best one is. Uh, 233 here. Uh, so what that means is that it's taking a look at each of these things and try to figure out which one is best. What you want to do now is take the one that's best, let's click on it there, and you'll see it opens up here, and you can, you can actually take a look at it. Um, these tools in the upper left or upper right corner here, <coughs> Uh, you can use these to, to brighten up your image to make it a little bit easier to see. It's tricky, especially when you're using a trackpad rather than a mouse to adjust. Um, so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to brighten this up. You drag these, the middle slider and the left slider, you drag them over a little bit. That's so you can just start to see well, it's a little harder to see on the video here, but on my screen, you can just start to see the galaxy starting to become uh, evident in the middle here. You can barely see the spiral arms coming out. The thing you can see is you can see the stars. And if you put your mouse uh, over the image, it'll give you a little, a little zoom here. See in the upper left corner there, it's showing you a close-up. So if I put my mouse over a star, you know, I can take a look at what the star shape looks like. And you know, just check and make sure your stars look reasonably round. I mean, you know, they have to be perfect now. Mine never are. Take them, take them as, take, take the one that's as good as you can. So what you want to do is you want to you want to go through these frames. Um, you can click on these frames, and if you flip through each of these frames in Deep Sky Stacker, it'll show you this preview of what the image looks like. That hasn't, it hasn't actually done anything with this image yet. It's just giving you a preview of what it looks like so you can get a better idea of whether you've got some bad frame in there that you want to exclude from your stack. So that's what you want to do. Flip through all your light frames, make sure that they look good. If they don't, you just uncheck it there and it will get excluded from the stack. Uh, but these ones, uh, I selected the good ones. So I was going to post the bad ones online. Um, so I selected the good ones, so we're going to include all five of these frames in the, uh, in the stack here. Uh, but again, you know, if there's a bad one that you don't like, go ahead and exclude that. Now the last step before we stack them is we go back and we look at our scores and pick the best one, right click on that, and set it as the reference frame. And see that gives you a little asterisk here, right? And what the asterisk means is that all the other images are going to be lined up to that image. So, you know, generally, this is, generally it's the one with the best score you want to use. But, you know, do a reality check. Open it, open it here and, you know, run your mouse across it to make sure that there's nothing crazy going on there. Because sometimes these scores aren't right. Yeah, well, yeah. What's the, what are the metrics for determining what that score is? That's a good question. I, I do not know. Um, but one of the reasons I say you want to do a reality check on this is that, like, I have found um, times when if there's star trailing or if an airplane ran through your picture, sometimes Deep Sky Stack will regard that as, as data, right? And because there's extra data in that image, it gets a higher score. And so that's the one you don't want to use. You, you, you still may be able to include that, that image. We'll, I'll show you why in a second here. But you don't want to use it to, as the registration frame. You want to pick a different one for registration. So we've got everything set now. It knows uh, how to line up the frames. It knows which one to use for registration. Let's look at my notes here. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Would you show again how you designate it as the reference frame? Um, you just uh, click on it. Yep. And do a right click, okay. and it'll pop up this dialog box here. Okay. Great, thanks. 
Uh, one last thing that I need to, I always need to remember, because I shoot in monochrome, I, I always forget this stuff. If you're shooting with color, you want to go down here to the, the uh, raw, the settings for raws or for fits. Um, and I have to be honest and say, I can't quite remember how to do this. The last time I used a color camera was probably six years ago. Um, but you need to go into this dialog box that pops up from here. And you need to make sure, depending on whether you're capturing raw or capturing in fits, you need to make sure that these settings are right. Usually, usually the default like this is going to be OK. Um, just so I know, has, has anybody used Deep Sky Stacker with, with cup to stack color data recently? So do you remember what settings you're using in the, in the color dialog? I, I never opened that dialog. <laughs> OK. Well, so it may be. What, what camera do you use again? I, I've got a uh, D810 uh, Alpha. OK. Well, so it may be that um, Deep Sky Stacker pretty much already knows. Are you capturing the raw or is fits? Uh, raw. OK. So it may be for raw, the default settings work just fine. Um, I was shooting with a QHY8, which is a, uh, you know, a dedicated astro camera, but uses a color chip. And I was finding back then, five, six years ago, that I actually needed to go into these settings, because I was capturing these fits. I needed to go into these settings, and I think I needed to, uh, I needed to check, I needed to check this box uh, to tell it, you know, this this is how it's being captured, and I needed to select the right one here, you know, and I needed to make sure that the bare filter pattern actually matched up. Hopefully, nobody needs to suffer through that. If you do, though, talk to your camera manufacturer. If you've got an Astro camera that, that that's doing this, a color Astro camera. Talk to your camera manufacturer, he'll be able to tell you what settings to use here. If you're using a DSLR and you're running into wacky color problems, talk to other people who are using a DSLR or other people like on cloudy nights, and they'll be able to tell you exactly what settings you need to use here. Again, it depends on your camera, and my sense is that if you're capturing RAW with a DSLR, you probably don't need to mess with this anymore. Um, but if you're using an Astro camera, and you're capturing as fits, you may need to go in here and pick the right box and, and even, you know, you can see these color patterns actually change depending on what you, what you pick. You may actually need to tell it, okay, this is, this is how the, the bare matrix uh, on my chip and my camera works. But that's something that you need to ask people about, you know, find out how this works. So for us, we're shooting monochrome data here. We're stacking monochrome data, so we don't need to worry about any of that. Um, and I think we're all set here. We've fed in all our frames, we've got our lights set, we've got all our calibration flame, frames included in the stack. Um, one last thing I'll do here, you don't actually need to do this, but if you go over here to compute offsets, that will show you over here where it says DX and DY. It'll show you how each of these frames are going to be adjusted to match up to your registration frame. They'll get you know translated in x and y axes a little bit. And they'll also get rotated a little bit. Uh, there's more going on than that behind the scenes, but this is just like a rough idea to show you what's happening. And as you can see, not surprisingly, for your reference frame, you know there's no translation and there's no rotation because that's the reference frame that everything else is being lined up to. So you don't need to do that, but that, that'll just give you. A, you know, actually, now that I'm saying this, I would recommend doing that because there have been times, thinking back on it, there have been times that when I've done that compute offset steps, I wind up with zeros for some of my images here. And the reason you wind up with zeros for some of your images there is that Deep Sky Stacker was not able to register those against your the, the registration frame that you checked. So that may leave you to select a different registration frame, but whatever else it will alert you to the fact that there may be some problems with trying to use those, those um, images in your stack. Whatever else, if you run and they've got zeros here for, for offsets and angles, um, if you try and run those, they will not be included in the stack. So you may think that you're stacking 30 images, and in fact, you're only stacking 20. So, so yeah, now that I'm thinking of it, clicking compute offsets is a good reality check to make sure that everything is right before you start stacking. Uh, okay, so we go over to stacked, uh, stacked pictures now. 
And I'll just check my notes to make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Oh yeah, one last thing that we want to do when we go into uh, stack pictures, it'll pop up a dialog box. And you want to look at the settings that are in here. It'll actually, if you click recommended settings, it'll give you some warnings and tell you things that you want to do here. But generally, you go into the stacking parameters, and this is where you're telling, you're telling Deep Sky Stacker, this is how I want you to stack the data. Generally, for your first image, you'll find that the default settings here are fine. You don't have to worry about them. The one thing that you might need to adjust is here in lights. There's these tabs across the tab. Up in lights, you may want it set to, to average um, if you have a small number of frames. I usually, I'm stacking with you know, 20, 30 frames at a minimum, even if I'm shooting narrow band images. And when I'm doing that, I almost always click this setting, auto adaptive weighted average. Um, basically what that does is it'll help control hot pixels. It'll, it'll help control hot pixels. Um, I don't, that's what all of these settings in this particular dialog are for. When we go into, uh, into Deep Sky, sorry, when we go into Pix Insight, I'll show you a little bit more about what these, these are called clipping settings. And I'll show you a little bit more about what they mean. Um, but basically, these are the different algorithms that Deep Sky Stacker will use to stack. I mean, either it'll just average all the frames, it'll take the median, you know, what it's doing is it's looking at each pixel. It's, it's lined them all up, and so each pixel now, theoretically, is where it should be. And so if I've got uh, 50 images, I've got a stack of pixels, 50 pixels tall, right? And what it does with averaging is, for that pixel in the final image, it just averages them, right? It can also run a medium uh, uh, instead of an average. It can start doing clipping, which means, and there are different settings for that. And what that means is that if one of those pixels is way out of whack with the rest of the pixels, it'll actually just get excluded from the stack. And instead of stacking 50, it'll stack 49. There's a little bit more going on under the hood than that. Auto adaptive weighted average, my understanding is that that is an algorithm that's designed to take some of the guesswork out of these, these clipping settings. So if you've got enough images, 20, 30, you probably should be enough. And you, if you want to run with auto adaptive weighted, weighted average, that'll probably be everything. Otherwise, if you got only a few, a, a few frames, use average instead. Yeah, Greg? I, I was just going to ask if you're concerned about blowing out highlights. So where, where I am, uh, a lot of light pollution and I have long exposures, so I have a tendency of needing the long exposures for the very uh, dark stuff. And it has a tendency to blow out the highlights yeah. sometimes. Is, you're saying you think that adaptive will, will help you in that regard? No. No. So, all, the, the only solution to that is shorter exposures, but more of them. Okay. There's, yeah, there, I mean, once you start, once you start overexposing, there's no recovery from that. It is, it is what it is, because that's what it is in the data. And it's no. That's, that's right. It's so, so. I don't do them all at the same time. Yeah, yeah. So, so, I mean, you know, my recommendation would be take the hit with shorter exposures and just do more of them. You'll, you'll, you'll find that, yeah, it's a trade off in, in sensitivity, especially with the DSLR. Um, but it's, you know, some people even take short exposures of the bright part and then take longer exposures to, 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 uh, to pull in the background and process them separately and then blend them together. Okay, so that it, more work, but it works. In the, there's no feature or setting that allows it to automatically do that if I have a range of exposures. There isn't even that in the Pixel site. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so so I don't know if you guys remember about a year ago, I posted an image of a planetary nebula that had this super, super faint halo on the outside of it, just a, a brilliant core. This is um, the blue snowball in, in Andromeda, little planetary nebula, and visually you can't see the, the halo at all. It, it takes like you know, 10, 20 hours of O3 exposures before you start to pull that out. 
but, um, and, but I, and I shoot 20 minute exposures. Even with an O3 filter, a 20 minute exposure was burning out the core. And so what I did was I took a series of two minute exposures of the core and 20 minute exposures of the halo. And there's a tool in, in PixInsight, won't, won't get into it here because it's way advanced. But ask me about it later, I can tell you how it works. You, you, you just tell PixInsight, hey, I've got two separate sets of exposures, and PixInsight says, okay, I'll put them together for you. And, you know, a little messing with the settings, but not much. It, it really it did a great job, it took, took my work. Yeah, but what this is doing is, this is dealing with hot pixels in your camera. So, you know, hopefully your, your dark frames took care of your hot pixels. Hopefully you guys dither when you're capturing the images, you know, which is the, the telescope moves a tiny bit in between each. So the, the same hot pixel doesn't stay, stay over the same part of your galaxy during, during the entire imaging session. But if you do that, you know, hot pixels will be a lot easier to deal with, but you, know, you always have some left over, and that's what these clipping settings are all about. But again, you know, my experience with Deep Sky Stacker, once I started running enough pictures through the, 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 the processing, was an auto-adaptive weighted average to care of all for him. Okay, so we've got all our settings here. Make sure I'm not missing anything. Uh, so we're set here. We'll go ahead and click Run. And so what it's doing right now is it's starting with the flats. And it's creating a master flat for you. And then it goes through the offsets. I call them biases. Some people call them offsets, and Deep Sky Stacker likes that. It creates a master offset for you. And then it, I guess it already created a master dark. Um, and then it slowly, bit by bit, uh, posts out for you the final image. Um, oh, you know what? I did not take my own advice here. And I used. Auto adaptive weighted average, even though I don't have enough images for that. So, because I only had five frames, I was supposed to use average. Uh, because, for whatever reason, the auto adaptive weighted average does not work well, does not work well with that, that set of, of data when the, the data set is so small. So, we meant to run it with average instead. And what you'll find is that um, these guys sector will run through all your data. It'll create the masters for you. It'll save those for you too. So if you if you want to use those masters later on while you're processing a different set of data, you'll have it, and you won't have to go through this whole process again. There we go. That's better. So now, it, if this is the output file, it's calibrated all those five lights against you know bias, flats, darks, uh, and then it integrated the five calibrated lights, uh, uh, aligned them. And then it stacked them up, and now it's giving you one output image here. Um, if you if you look back in the Deep Sky Stacker, Deep Sky Stacker will save all those intermediate frames for you, or at least you can tell it to. That's that's one of the options you have. So if you want to avoid this process, but but still go in and play with some of the semi raw data, you'll be able to get back into it. But easy way, this is this is the final output image here. And so, what we do is go over to save picture file down here in the lower left under processing. And to save it as, for this one I usually save as a 16-bit image. Um, you can save it as a 32-bit image, although I think most of you guys will discover that Photoshop doesn't really do much with 32-bit images. You pretty quickly have to convert it back to 16-bit. PixInsight, on the other hand, is a 32-bit program, which has advantages. You can stretch your images in ways that you can't do with, with Photoshop. So that's another advantage that you see with PixInsight. Anyway, just go over it, give it a name. Uh, here you can see I just called it Stack. Uh, save it. And you're set. That's everything that you do in Deep Sky Stack. So now you have one image. <clears throat> now we've only done the, the luminance frames. What we're going to do we'll go back into our stack, we'll go back up here to open picture files, and so it shows you your file list again. Now, we're doing a different set here, 
But what we did last time was we picked frame 13 as our reference frame, as a registration frame. And all of the lights that we ran through for this luminance set, they were all lined up in frame 13 in the luminance set. So when I go through and I do my blue frames, and my green frames, and my red frames, they also have to be lined up to frame 13 in the luminance set. Because otherwise it's not going to match up. And you're going to wind up with a blue frame, and a green frame, and a red frame that don't line up with the luminance frame. And you're going to suffer. So um, what we're going to do here, uh, I think I'll just clear the set. So what I'm going to do is I open up my picture files again. Let's go ahead and we'll do the blues. And I'm also going to open up Luminance Frame 13, because I need that in my set. So there are my, there's my blue. And again, I go back and I load in my darks. Oops. So I load in my darks, I load in flats that I took for the blue filter, there they are, and I load in the offset and bias frames again. Now, you can see that Deep Sky Stacker actually saved the master here for the biases, uh, and it also, I didn't, I didn't notice this, I didn't mention it at the time, but it also saved the master for the darks when it was doing the, the luminance set. So you don't have to, to, to do this whole process again. You could just include the master. Let's just do that for the bias frame. It saves you a little bit of work. Uh, so you see under type here, you see that um, the sky stacker recognizes that that's a master bias, a master offset frame, as opposed to just a single one. And again, I could have done the same thing with the, with the darks. So, but it just saves the, the trouble. It doesn't have to go to, to, through the trouble and the time of creating a new master. Yeah, Bob. How important is it to take flats in each color? Are the flats going to change from color to color? So, best practice is to take flats for each filter, right? Best filter. Because if you've got, um, uh, if you've got uh, different dust spots or even you know, different thicknesses or maybe well, one filter is wavy in one spot and the other, other filter isn't, then you can uh, see differences in the results. On the other hand, if you screw up the way I recently did and you say forget to take some flats for one color, you may discover that you can cheat and you can tell it, hey, this these are flats for my blue filter when in fact they were flats for your green filter. And you can get away with that. Uh, it's probably not as good, but uh, particularly if it's just the color data that you're worrying about, you may be able to get away with that. But yeah, I mean, the best practice generally is to, to shoot separate flats for a green filter. Now for you guys who are going out in the field and setting up and breaking down each night, I know that that's kind of a pain, particularly if you don't have a flat panel. So the answer to that is, Get a flat panel. Um, for you guys who weren't here last time around, um, it, it seems to be becoming clear that these edge illuminated LED panels that they use for tracing, uh, that you can buy off of Amazon for 25 bucks, they pretty much do everything you need for flats these days. It used to be that if you wanted a, a, a real flat panel, you were going to spend hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars to, to get it, and it was going to be you know, all the bells and whistles and everything like that. I've been using a flat panel, and mine is bigger because I have a C11, but I've been using a flat panel that I bought off of Amazon six months ago for 43 bucks. Did you? And as near as I can tell, I, I compared it against sky flats, which are supposed to be the gold standard for flats. I, can't, I can see a difference. They're not precisely the same. If I, if I subtract one result from the other result, I see a difference, but one isn't any better than the other. And they both require a little bit of touch up later on. So, so the, yeah, the answer to the flats problem, I think, is, has arrived, which is get a cheap uh, tracing, LED edge lit tracing panel, and you, know, you can take your flats then whenever you want. Yeah, just to follow up on that idea, do you use uh, uh, the t-shirt uh, 
on the Yeah, I do. But you know the truth is I suspect I probably don't need to. Yeah, I haven't tried using it yet and I'm just wondering whether that's it, you know the thing. So the thing about the a flat panel is that it's on the end of your scope, so it's already wildly out of focus. Right. You know, you're you're focused on the moon. You know, <laughs> so when you're when you're when your flat panel is you know two inches away from your objective, it's going to be vastly out of focus. So the the idea of the, the t-shirt was when you were shooting sky flats, which might have say a stray cloud in them or even a bird flies through a flame frame, or a plane flies through the frame, then the t-shirt would solve that. So my guess is that I probably don't need the t-shirt anymore, but you know, of course I have it. It's right there, I was just put it on, you know, why not? Uh, but my guess is you probably don't need to worry about t-shirt diffusion anymore. Hey, do you usually uh, take the flats same time you're taking your, uh, your images? Yeah, well, I'm, perma I'm permanently set up now. So since it's all out in my backyard, nothing changes. And I don't have to take flats the same night that I'm shooting the lights. Yeah, usually, uh, kind of when I'm done taking the lights, the darks, and the biases, it's two in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, see, that's, that's the advantage of the flat panel. That at least if you can you know, black out the edges so you're not blinding anybody around you, um, you know, once you can do that, you can shoot your flats anytime you want. Yeah. 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 Well, as long as you didn't, as long as you didn't move anything in your in your setup. Yeah. 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 Um, as a practical matter, how do you actually hold this this flat panel two inches above your objective? Make a special holder. I I point it straight up, and then I just yeah. set it on the top. <laughs> yeah. It, in in theory, because I have a moving mirror C11. When I, if, if the telescope moves to a different orientation, the mirror can shift. And that can shift all the vignetting patterns inside the scope, <coughs> and all the reflection patterns, and, and, and the flat won't work. In practice, though, I've discovered that as long as I don't try and shoot flats pointing at the horizon against lights that were shot directly overhead, I'm fine. Um, now, in part, that may be because from, from my observatory, because I've got all the trees, I really can't get below 40 degrees or so for, for most of my shots. So straight overhead is never going to be more than, say, 50 degrees off what I was really shooting. So for me, I found that it works out fine. And for you guys who have refractors, you're fine. Or if you have, even if you have an SCT, as long as you have mirror locks on your SCT, you're fine. And it's really only the older SCTs that I think will we'll run into problems with the you know, shooting flats and lights in different positions. So yeah, just, just point it straight up, set it on top, and I'm done. All right, so we're doing our blue frames here. John, can I ask a basic question? Sure, go ahead. Uh, Kevin, is it? Yes. Um, the fact, and this is extremely basic, I'll make it quick. Because we're talking about the color filter, does that necessarily mean the images came from monochrome, monochrome setup? Yeah. That if you, yeah, if you use the color setup, then we wouldn't need to be talking about this most of it. Yeah, that's right. But the better images, from what I understand, come through monochrome with filtration, with a filter we Is that generally? Well, if you're shooting through light, light pollution, your better images will come from a monochrome camera with, with narrow right. band filters. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so, so that's, that's how these are put together. Okay. I've got a, the, the detector itself is monochrome, meaning there's no color right. or rotate right. 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 so, so these are the blues here. Um, now, you remember we said we were going to have to include this light frame, this luminance frame from the other stack, because that's what we've been using as a reference frame. So again, same way we were doing it before, we will uh, flip through our images, the settings work for the blues. Yeah, it's pretty dark for the blues. I'm not going to be anywhere, it's anywhere near as bright as the luminance image. So let's see what I can do here. I'm just tweaking these little settings in the upper right corner to make it a little easier to see. It's still pretty dark. It's tough. Definitely not designed for processing, but you can see, you know, you can now see that there's a little bit of spiral arms around there. This is a blue image, and you can 
hover your mouse over a star, and you can see, yeah, the star's worked out through there. So that frame looks fine. You know, flip through your frames, see if they all look good. And these ones, these ones all look fine, I think. So we'll use all these in the stack. Again, if you found one that's bad, just uncheck it over here and it'll be excluded from the stack. Um, I am going to go back to that light frame now. And again, I'm going to right click on it, use it as the reference frame, but I'm probably getting ahead of myself. So just, just right check and, and use it as the reference frame for now. Then run register check pictures, just like before. Again, check and make sure it's finding enough stars for you. 40, looks fine. Uh, hit OK. Is it doing anything with that information or is that just for you? Yeah, here actually it seems to be it seems to be actually registering. I'm not sure why. Hmm. Well, either way, um, since you just ran the registration, you can now come and see. So here's here's the scores that you got. You can see the scores because this is color data. The scores are way less than a luminance frame like this one up here. Um, but what I want to make sure is that they all got included. So I'm going to go over here to compute offsets. And yeah, so. Deep Sky Stacker has figured out how to match all these up against this, this luminance frame here. So everything is set now. We've got all the data for the, for the blue that, that, uh, that we want to include. One last thing that we need to do, though, we've got this luminance frame here that we're using as, as, as the registration frame. But we don't actually want to stack it, because we're only creating a blue image here. So to solve that, we uncheck it over here. So now it'll still be used, you see the asterisk, it'll still be used as the reference frame, but it won't be included in the data that gets put out. Only the blue frames will be included in the stack. And then you just go back over here, check your stacking parameters, make sure it's set on average, because I don't have much data. Again, if you have a lot of images, use auto-adaptive weighted, weighted average. But here I've only got five frames, so I'm just going to use average. And then it'll go ahead and it'll do the same thing on the blue data that it did with the, uh, uh, the luminance frames. Now, is there a difference if you just take all of your light frames and, and dump them in and process it all at one time? Uh, yeah, you can't really do that. Um, because that's kind of what I just did. If you, if you dump all of that. <laughs> so, so what will happen is that it will, it will create a stack using all of those light frames. Right. And so all, in addition to you know, stacking luminance, it included all the red, green, and blue in there as well. Right. And since red, green, and blue are completely different from your luminance image, you don't want to do that. You gotta, you've got you've to stack them separately. There are, there are a few little tricks that you can use in Deep Sky Stacker to save you some labor. Um, but basically, what I showed you is, is what you need to do. There, are, I, I, I spent a lot of, during the years that I was using Deep Sky Stacker, I tried to come up with you know, tricks and conveniences and shortcuts, but I never really found many. With PixInsight, you see you can do what you just did, because PixInsight knows what those frames are. It knows that those were blue frames. It knows that these were red frames. It knows those flats are for your blue filter. It knows. It knows all about your images, so you just dump them in, and it'll it'll sort out uh, everything for you. But deep sky stacking, you gotta you gotta make sure you tell it the right things. Uh, I just want to point something out. Um, so this is the output frame from Blue, and again we would go down here, save picture to file, and we would save it. You know, I just call it Blue. So again, I just saved it as a 16-bit image. Um, I just noticed something, though. Let me go back to the registration list. Cancel that. Um, look at this. See that frame down there? So that's what, blue frame number five, right? Notice here, under the dx, dy, and angle, it's had, you have nc for the registration frame. Because it's 
by definition, nothing needs to be done for it. Everything is getting lined up to it. So it doesn't need to have any you know, shift, any translation, an angle, or, or in, uh, any rotation or any translation. Um, the other images, you can see that the first blue image, you know, it shifted a little in X, shifted a little in Y, rotated very slightly in angle. And the same thing is true for the first four reference, for the first four blue frames, but then we come down here to blue frame number five, and while it got a score of 36.79, which note is the worst of the blue frames, it has NCs down here for uh, uh, translation and for angle. And what that means is that Deep Sky Stacker could not figure out how to match that up to my reference frame. And what that means is it got excluded from the stack. So the output here is not five blue frames, it's four blue frames. That's why you want to use this <clears throat> compute offsets up here at the top before you register to look for problems like this. Now, there isn't always a solution. But at least this way you know that you've got a problem and you can try and come up with a solution. If you just hit that, red, that stack button, like I did, you might not notice that you ran into this problem and that you're only getting a stack of, you know, say, 10 images when you thought you were getting a stack of 20. Um, you, the way I used to notice this was I would um, go through my luminance red, green, and blue stacks at the end, and I would think, you know, wow, my green stack is awful compared to the others. Why is that? And it took me a while to figure out what was really going on was that, say, only three frames from the green data got stacked. And you, know, you can, there are ways around that. You, you, you'll have to fool a deep sky stacker and, and get it to align. You may have to find a different reference frame. You, know, you, you can get, if not all of your data, you can usually get most of your data to stack. But, you may have to, to monkey with it like this. Yeah, if you don't click compute offset, will it not exclude that one frame? That goes no, it'll still be excluded. You just won't know. You know it, it has to compute these offsets before it does the stack. So, but yeah, you just don't find out. Before, that's all. Yeah? How much time lag would there between images taken, let's say, with the blue, generally one second, 50 seconds, it just depends on the object? Well, so these are two minute exposure. Okay, two, okay, two minutes for exposure. And, and then next question is, what? Wh why would they vary? Is it the equatorial amount? Is it mirror shift? Is it? Oh, you mean why? Why, yeah, why, why, why one side? Um, yes. Well, so I don't know. That's a good question. Let me let me look at it and see if I can figure out what's what's great right about it. Is it the? Are you guiding on these images? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so maybe the guider or Yeah, I mean maybe yeah. the maybe the guiding was just off okay. on these images. You know, I mean I'm looking at this image and it looks okay. This is you know, this is some this is something that happens sometimes. You you go back and you, you say, you know, Deep Sky Stacker says to you, hey, I can't use that one. And you go back at it, like I'm like we're doing now, and you compare it to the other ones and yeah, I mean, is this, so this is number four that I'm looking at here, trying to look at the stars in four. So there's the star in frame four that was, that was okay. And here's the same star in frame five. Yeah. Maybe it's a little fuzzier. Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, I can't, I can't understand why Deep Sky Stacker did not take this one. Um, one way around this is when we were talking a little earlier about um, hunting for stars to, to make sure there were enough stars in. When you go to register and you get this register settings dialog and you go to advanced and you compute the number of detected stars, you may find that you need to push the slider further to the left to get more stars and then it will accept the frames that it's rejected. So that's one of the ways that you can try to work your way around this. Another way, take a different reference frame. Um, another way, stack all your blue images first and get one one blue master frame and then try and stack it against your master light frame that's not the best technique because you're 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 losing something by doing that definitely best to have each individual frame lined up to the master light rather than having your master blue frame lined up to the master light but 
if you want to include the data in the stack, sometimes you've got to make compromises. How much of each color would you generally shoot for this galaxy? Is it going to be 10 images per color? Depends how much time you have. Okay. <laughs> I'm permanently set up. Yeah, that's right. So, so you know, I can I can go out and I can collect you know 20 hours. Well, okay, in theory I can collect 20 hours of data on a target, but um, you know because my observatory is in my backyard. But um, spring galaxy is not so much because the weather in spring is you know it, it's dramatically worse than what we have in the fall. So on on narrow band targets that I'm shooting in the fall. With narrowband filters, I can easily get you know, 20, 30, 40 hours on one target. But on galaxies, uh, you know, I, I, have, I have a limited hole for the sky anyway through yeah. trees. And so it, you know, getting much above 10 hours on a galaxy is, can be challenging for me. Spring is over by that time. That's, that's the problem for me. What about people who don't have uh, permanent setups? You know, that you're going to have to tear it down and stuff. You're going to be limited to what you can get in the night, or no, you can you can still go out and, and stack individual nights. Um, what you'll find is, first of all, you want to try and make it as repeatable as possible. Okay. So if if this is how you're framing the target on night one, you don't want to frame it like this on night two. Right. You know, if it's framed 45 degrees off, deep sky stacker, and I say, I give up. You're hard. Okay. You know, you're on your own. Um, so try and frame it as close as you can to the way you originally framed it. And if you did that, you'll need to create a set of flats for each night. Mm -hmm. But at least you can, depending on what kind of camera you have, you can use the same set of biases and you can use the same set of darks. Flats you'll probably want to create each night though. Because if you're, you know, it depends again on, on how much you break down your gear. But if, if you dismount the camera, mm -hmm. you got to create new flats. That's but true. if you do that, then you can shoot across many nights and still stack all the data up. You just do it the same way. What, what you have to do is, in Deep Sky Stacker, it'll create these intermediate frames for you. It'll create calibrated frames that are not stacked for each night. And so each night you go through and you do this. You create all your calibration frames. So like I would have a calibrated blue number one, blue frame one. I would have a calibrated blue frame two. You know, and I would have calibrated versions of all of these frames. And then I would run them all against the reference frame. And that would create frames that are calibrated and registered for each of these colors. Or and then once I've got all the calibrated and registered files and I'm all done capturing my data, then I go and I stack it all up. So you can shoot across multiple nights and it takes more work, but in large part, okay, in large part it takes more work because you've got to break down and set up gear every night. But the thing that you need to remember is to take flats every night you're out there. You know, again, you may be able to get away with it uh, without taking flats, but you may. You may think you can get away with it, and then when you go to process your data, you discover you can't. And at that point, you don't really have a fix. So if you can shoot the flats, mm -hmm. shoot, shoot a set of flats while you're out there. That's one of the joys of going for something multi-day, like the, the, the almost seven star party, or these Krustab uh, uh, observing sessions that Novak runs every month from Right, because you've got, a, you've got a weekend or... Exactly, yeah. set up there for three nights, and yeah. you don't have to tear it down. So a lot of that uncertainty is taken away. Like the, the idea of ripping all my equipment out of my observatory and dragging it out of the field for one night is I'm not. That'd be, that'd be a part. Right, right. right. Things but to, you know, to, to, to go up for, for four or five nights up to the Mountain Institute, you know, that's worth it. Mm -hmm. That's worth it. Um, but yeah, I, my hat is off to you guys who break up your gear and you know, break down your gear and then set it up again every time you go out. I, 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 would, n I would not be able to do it. it just, I wouldn't be able to do it. It would just be too hard. I'm, I'm looking for the very first time this fall when we go to HSP, I'm going to be pulling my gear out of my observatory. And pulling the gear out of the old little doghouse observatory was challenging. Um, and I, I'm hoping that now I've got all my processes figured out. Um, but I had gotten the equipment um, a few weeks before uh, 
uh, almost had them last fall. And I was going to do it. I was going to bring it all up to West Virginia. And I was starting to get it all packed up and facing up to the task. And I went over to my uh, imaging laptop, this, this thing here. Actually, the machine before this thing here. And uh, it had crashed and burned during the um, time that I had been building my observatory and not imaging. And so it's two days before AHSP, and I've got a dead laptop faced with the, the task of reloading all the software into it, troubleshooting all the software all over again to make it all play nice with each other. And I said, you know, I don't really need to bring my gear up to all this <laughs> because there are a lot of big telescopes that I can look through up there. And that's what I did, and it was great. I spent the night walking around looking through giant daubs of things that you know, I, would, I would never see uh, otherwise. So yeah, but this year I'm going to bite the bullet and try and do it. Might be, cheap, might be, just be easier to buy a portable set of gear. Yeah, could be. Could be. But then I would have to learn a whole new set of gear. No, just buy a duplicate and get it. <laughs> oh, uh, I don't know. I'm actually, I'm actually hoping that I've built some modularity into my system um, so that, it, so that the, 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 the setup and breakdown process won't uh, be as horrific uh, as it might be otherwise. But you know, the, the proof is in the pudding. So we'll find out in September. We'll find another set on exactly the same thing. So it will save you half a time in the future. If you buy it exactly. I got them all set up. Yeah. And then you set up side by side. And then you can take pictures, you can save your app and Yeah, so I'd have twice as many pictures if I had two setups. Yeah, that's that's a problem. I would feel a need to have them both set up at home all the time, so I'm using them, because otherwise. You just have to travel a lot. Oh, okay. That's the solution. You have to travel a lot. <laughs> okay. Last night when I was at the was that I was talking about with a side by side scope. Say half the time we take to come out the mail uh, and then for for the session. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that some of you guys do a, like a side by side setup, and that's that's very impressive. I've never tried to do anything like that, um, but I know I know people who do that. They have like shoot color on shoot color with this OTA and shoot monochrome with this OTA, and it's all on the same mount and it's impressive stuff. <laughs> Um, all right, so what we've done here is we, we've stacked up our blue images now. You do the same thing for green and red. And in the end, what you find is that you have one set of stacked images, uh, and you're ready to put them out. Um, so what I did in the, the, the data set that I distributed, uh, I included um, the master frames that were, you know, assembled from hundreds of uh, hundreds of individual frames, not just the five that we've been using in the, the, the practice run here. So what we're going to do now is we're going to move over into Photoshop, and I will show you how to do the scratching part uh, over in Photoshop and how to put those colors together into one final image. So that means I'm going to shift to the other PC. So the, the end product of the deep sky stacker is what we just meant. The end product is stacked, a group of stacked images that then you transfer to Photoshop. Yes, okay. that's right. Yeah. So you, you'll take your hundreds of individual frames for each channel, each color filter, and feed them in the Deep Sky Stacker with the calibration frames. The Deep Sky Stacker gives you one back for each, for each color filter. So because I shoot LRGB, my output will consist of uh, uh, one luminance frame, one red frame, one green frame, and one uh, one blue frame, and that's the that's the output that I'll that I'll wind up with. Okay, so we're going to go over here into Photoshop. That's kind of a preview of where uh, where my processing wound up. Um, one, just so that everybody knows, one of the challenges that we face with this projector is that it, it wants to crop, it wants to frame differently than what we generally have on our screens. So bear with me for a minute here to uh, make things work out.
Right, so what we're going to do is, in LRTV processing, you usually do, you put your effort into the luminance frame, because that's where your real information is, that's where your sharpness is, that's where you, know, you really get the data. The color is, it's color on top of the luminance, so we don't put as much effort into it. Um, let's start with the luminance frame here, and I put it in master. So I've got two different sets here because these, these ones are for picks and sight, whereas these ones are geeks guy stacker. These are tips, whereas picks and sight uses this format called XISF. And so there's my luminance frame from geeks guy stacker. And as you can see, this is what this is what the luminance frame actually looks like. It's basically black. Luminance frame is shot through no filter or what kind of filter? Yeah, well, basically through a clear filter. Yeah, clear. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so, so it captures all the light. Yeah. You know, whereas, a, say, a, a, a blue filter is throwing away three quarters of the light that lands on the, the camera. Uh, so that whereas, so the luminance filter is any photon will pass through that in theory will pass through that luminance filter and, and make its way down to the chip and get recorded. Um, but still. This is what deep sky imaging gives you, and it's not very bright. So you got to work to turn this into your final image. Right. So over here, and make it a little more clear what I'm doing. This is the limitations of our projector size here. Okay, that's good enough. So the version of Photoshop that I'm using here is CS2. Um, I keep saying that, that I should move to um, the newer version of Photoshop. Um, CS2 is not particularly friendly with Windows 10 and Windows 8. I mean, it works okay. I mean, you'll see, it'll, it'll work fine for what we're doing here. But every once in a while, you run into stupid little glitches that, 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 that are a pain to get around. So, I mean, you know, my feeling is it costs, I think, 10 bucks a month uh, to be on, on Photoshop CC. And you know, again, 120 bucks a year. If you get into seriously into deep sky imaging, 120 bucks a year will be nothing. Um, and it'll just, it'll just save you the annoyances that, that you don't have to deal with. So while you can find Photoshop CS2 on the web, if you're if you're really going to do this, just just go ahead and get Photoshop CC, so you don't have to deal with the, the little annoyances that, that I keep finding in CS2. I would do that myself. It's just it isn't. It isn't the 120 bucks a year that's deterring me. It's the oh man, I gotta learn another piece of software. Um, but yeah, one day I'll I'll just bite that bullet and, and do that too. But right now I've got too many too many software learning curves in front of me for you know, other parts of other things. Um, so we've opened our luminance frame here. Just do that with you know file and open the normal the normal route windows. Uh, and this is what it looks like. So what we're going to do is we're going to start stretching this. Um, here, like I said, because that's where you want to do most of your effort, because that's where most of the information your brain will perceive is from the limits. Uh, so the way you do this, and we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about this, is through histogram tools. In Photoshop, the histogram tools are called levels and curves. Uh, somewhat similar in PixInsight, uh, but we want to explore both of them here. Uh, so, this is the layers panel over here, or the layers dialog, I guess, over here. 
and this is where I can, most of my tools, I can open up. Ah, okay. So this is the 32-bit image. Remember I told you that, that Pixels, or the Deep Sky Stacker can give you 32-bit images or it can give you 16-bit images. For whatever reason, when I did this before, I saved these as 32-bit images. So if you did that, the first thing you're going to have to do is to convert them. And that's up here under image mode, uh, 16 bits per channel. And I usually just hit OK here. I don't, I don't try and tweak any of these. Bad things happen. I try and, I try and tweak those. So I just, and, and you'll see I'll do this for the blue, green, and red frames too. Just convert them from 32 bit down to 16 bit. Oh, wow. So now it's a 16 bit image. And now my, my tools are active over here. The reason you have to convert from a 32 to a 16-bit image is because in Photoshop, most of the tools don't work for 32-bit images. There, I guess there's a few that do, otherwise it wouldn't open them as 32 bits, but not a lot of them. So what we're going to do with this is we're going to take this from this nice, nice black image that has very little information in it, and we're going to start to pull out the galaxy that's in it. So the way I do that in Photoshop is I use the Curves tool, uh, most of it, I use the Curves tool. So if you click on Curves, it'll pop up this dialog box. And basically what this dialog box is, is a histogram. Let me show you another histogram up here. It's not quite as big, but it's, it's useful. Yeah, so you can, the same thing that I was doing with the, the levels or the, the layers dialog uh, panel over there on the right, you can get the same tools from up here. You go to layer. If it lets you, you go to layer, and then you go to a new adjustment layer, and your curves and levels tools are both there. So we're going to do curves first, because that's what I almost always do. Actually, I see I've already created one by mistake earlier, so we'll just use this one to start out with. Um, what I want to do here is I want to show you how the histogram works. So we'll open it up. Um, how many of you guys know what a histogram is? Yeah, okay, all the hands go up. You're all, you're all technical people. Right? <laughs> so for, for the mere mortals who are watching this online, I, I'm going to explain what a histogram is. And so for for, for all three of you who did not know what a histogram was before, like I didn't when I got started on this, um, I, will, I will tell you. Um, you notice that the, the image is basically black now. There's a few stars, and you can almost kind of sort of see the galaxy starting to come out in the middle. Mostly it's black. And so up in the corner there, that's a histogram. And what the histogram is showing you is it has brightness across the x-axis here, and it has the number of pixels of that brightness on the y-axis going up. And so white is way over on this end, on the right, and pure black is way over on that end, on the left. And what you can see from looking at this particular histogram is that this image has almost all of its information way over on the black end. And so the galaxy itself, the stars maybe up here, you know, they're pretty well exposed because they're stars. The galaxy is probably the right hand edge of that hill right there. Just a tiny little bit of it. But what you want is for the galaxy to occupy a lot more of that histogram. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start stretching that histogram so that we take the parts of the galaxy that are almost black now and we brighten them up into you know, medium gray, even pushing them up towards a brighter gray, so that you are able to look at that image and get information out of it. And the way we're going to do that is to use the Curves tool. In Photoshop, this is the tool that I always start with. Um, you'll see I do it a little, little bit different way at Pixel site. I use the Levels tool instead, or the equivalent of the Levels tool instead. But for whatever reason, with Photoshop, I've always found it easier to use the Curves tool. 
And what I do is I simply grab hold with the mouse, grab hold of the middle of that, and pull it up. And you'll see that that'll start brightening up the image. So let me slide it out of the way a little bit here. We'll grab hold of it here with the mouse, and we'll drag it up. You see it brightened up the image a little bit there. And we're going to do this. We're going to do this several times. We're going to create several curves. And we're going to keep brightening it up like this. So, and, and you see each of these curves is still here. This is like a stack of layers on top of the original image. If I uncheck these eyes here, the adjustments that I made go away, but they're still there. You check the eyes and they come back. And you, if you look, by the way, there's the histogram that we started with up here in the upper, upper right. Once I started putting levels on it, you can see how that histogram brightens up. I got to click this to show you the current level. So you can see it's a much brighter histogram. And it's also it's starting to spread out. So that data that was all compressed over here, it's starting to spread out and fill more of the histogram and make it more obvious in the image. So you just went and applied one curve and then you applied another curve on top of that? That's right. Okay, good old Well, it, it's easier if you don't because it's easier to make incremental changes. Okay, I see how So you see I've started, that's, yeah. there's a third one here. Um, maybe I'll even do a fourth one here for right now. Is there a formal process in this inside? Yeah, it's called um, curves transformation. Yeah, well, I've used that, but I've only used it on just try to do all the ones. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Some success, but it's not. Pixinsight is, is more open to big changes, I find. Whereas I find in Photoshop, it's easier to make small ones. But still, even in Pixinsight, I probably would do it all at once. Um, so let me point out one thing before we move on. This is a quirk of, um, certainly it's a quirk of Photoshop CS2. I don't know whether this quirk survives in the later versions of Photoshop. Um, See in, the, see in the upper uh, left of the screen here where it says loom.tiff at 25%? This is, this is an, a 25% enlargement, it's, or 25% downsizing of the original image. And what you'll discover in older versions of Photoshop is that it posterizes. See, you know, see how the, the, there's these abrupt changes in, in, in levels here? You have to zoom in and you'll find that this is just this is just a Photoshop thing. If you zoom in above 50%, then this will go away. So, really, still? I don't, I just, this is one of those things about Photoshop I just don't understand. So here, we're at 25% enlargement. I'll go up to 50% enlargement. See, it's the same thing. Now I go up to 66% enlargement. Oh, no, sorry, I'm at 50% enlargement, so it's still the same thing. And I go up to 66%, and now it looks like a galaxy. So it doesn't affect the final image. No, yeah. it, this, isn't, this isn't in the data. It's just, oh. for whatever reason, this is the way PixInsight wants to present it to you on the screen. Okay. I don't know why it works this way, but until you get above 50% enlargement, I have always run into this. Mm -hmm. So this is just one of those quirks that you need to keep in mind. If you're looking at your data and you think, oh my god, it's all posterized, it looks awful, zoom in on it. And if you get above 50% enlargement, you'll probably see that it's not posterized at all. It's just the way Photoshop is presenting it to you. Got me. Um, so, so for the rest of the work we're going to do, we're going to have to be zoomed in like this. Otherwise, it's really going to be kind of hard to tell what we're doing. Um, I think at this point, if you look at the histogram up here, it's kind of moving all toward the middle. And what that means is that all this stuff over at the end is black but it's been pushed up, you know, it started out as black, meaning it's empty space. But it's been pushed up now so that the, the stuff that should be black space is now moving up to gray. That's why it's up here in the histogram now. And so now we're going to use the levels tool instead. And with levels, what I do is I grab this left-hand slider, that's the black point. And what it's doing is it's telling Photoshop the, these colors that I'm, I'm putting it under, they should be black. And so I'm going to slide it over 
let's say here. You don't want to start sliding over in here because that hill, that's your data. And you don't want to start clipping your data. But if you slide it over, like see, you can see how it's flat there, and that's probably fine. So slide it over like to the, to the base of this hill of data, and you won't have clipped anything, but you will have made this, this background will be a much more pleasing, pleasing black now. And so that's, in, in Photoshop, that's all I do with the levels tool. I just bring up, I just clip the background as well. I don't clip the background. I just darken up the background to make it, to, to make it look better. And now you can see that you know, a lot of these little background galaxies are really starting to jump out. And the, the spiral arms are starting to jump out. Even some of the, I don't know if you can see it up there, but on the screen I can see even some of the, the galaxy halo you know, connecting to the satellite galaxies has started to jump out a bit. And so that's what, our, that's what our new histogram looks like once we've applied these tools. So you can, you know, you can do this uh, until you're satisfied, basically. The uh, luminosity um, image that you got was also two minutes. Yeah, two minute exposures. Yeah. yeah, and it's like this is probably about 400 images. So what? 800 minutes is uh, what? Seven? No, it's like 12 hours, 12, 13 hours of, of luminance. That's a lot for me for for, for galaxies because, like I said, in spring I usually just don't have that much time on on one target. Um, this is shot with the old setup, by the way. This is before I got the observatory set up and, and have the new mount on it. Um, but, but I was really happy with the way this came out. You can see, like if you look in here in the core of the galaxy, you can actually see that there's some detail there in the core of the galaxy. M100, it turns out, is a really weird galaxy. Because there's like, there's like, you know, galaxy within a galaxy there. The challenge with M100 is that when you start brightening this up, you will blow that core out without even thinking about it. Yeah. We're not, we're, and that's in fact exactly what we're going to do. We're going to blow the core out. Um, once you get a little bit more experience with how to use masks, you can avoid doing that. But again, masks are a technique that today, you know, if we have some time later on, we can talk about it, but I probably won't spend, spend too much time talking about it uh, in this session. But anyway, so what you do is you just keep uh, repeating with curves and levels until you say, okay, good enough. Um, one of the questions, by the way, if I, if, I, if I have this little eyedropper tool here and I run it over the background, if I hold down my mouse button, you can see how, you can see how it shows you in the, the, the curves window there, it shows you what that, the brightness of that part of the image is. Okay. So you can see here it's brightening up because it's over that galaxy. Here it goes way up because it's over that star. And this is what the background of the image looks like. And so that, that gives me an idea of where I want to pull. Because I can grab hold of this here, I can grab hold of it here, I can do whatever I want with it. But basically for right now, like I'll do one more curve here. I think I want to try and make the background look a little darker, so I'll grab here and pull down a bit. And then, but I want to make these spiral arms stand out. You can see that that's where they are in the histogram. So I'm going to grab there and pull up a bit. You can see the problem is we start burning out the core of the galaxy here. And I had the, and I'm going to put a third point in here. You can use the arrow buttons to move these, these anchor points around a little bit. Yeah, like that. That's good. Okay, good enough. So that's what I like for my. Uh, I'm going to leave that as the, the final luminance image. Um, and uh, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to save that image. And I'm actually going to save it as a Photoshop image, it just makes it a little bit easier. So that's Photoshop format here, and we'll just call it Loom. Oops, wait, there one, one last thing before I save that. Um, I've discovered sometimes when I save things in Photoshop, I only wind up saving the top layer here, which is, wouldn't be an image, it would be that curve. Oops. So um, if you, again, key combination, control, alt, shift, all held down at the same time, N, E. 
All it did was it copied all the layers below and created one final image. So I just I usually label this as combine all below. So that's the that's the final image there. And now I can go in and I can save my image. So I want to save it as a Photoshop image here in PSD. Save it in the masters. That's what looks good. So, uh, excuse me, again, this is the final luminosity image that you would use to then apply the, the color blue the right. to it. Yeah. Right. So, what we're going to do now, I'll just set that aside for right now. What we're going to do now is we're going to open the color images. I just open the bridge. Yeah. Open the color images. <coughs> blue, green, red. And again, these are 32 bit images, so I don't know why I didn't just say them as 16s. But I have to go through and I have to convert them all down to 16s. So you lose a little bit of data there, yeah. down, convert, like that? Yeah, yeah, in theory. So you have different options here for how to do this conversion from 32 bit. And there have been times in the past where I, I messed around with local adaptation or even with equalized histogram as opposed to using the default, which is exposure and gamma. You know, and when you do that, you know, it gives you sliders that you can play with and stuff. But now you use pixel inside. So, yeah. Yeah. You don't have to worry about this kind of stuff anymore. Uh, with Pixinsight, you're working with a 32-bit image all through the process, so you don't have to make this compromise up front. Uh, you know, is, is, there, is there some difference you know, that, that, that matters? Yeah, probably. I mean, is it, is it huge? Probably not. It's one of those things, you know, you're getting the last 5% out of your image. All right, so right now I've got 16-bit versions of red, green, and blue images. And so now what do I do? <laughs> How do I get a color image out of this? And these are, these are grayscale images. I mean, I've called it red, but to Photoshop, you know, this, this image is red. It's a black and white image because I took it with a black and white camera. I took it through a red filter, so I know it's red, but Photoshop doesn't know that. So what I do is I go back up to the same dialog. I go to Image, Mode. And this time I go to RGB color. And I take one of my images, this, this, in this case I'm just using the red, just because it happens to be on top, and I turn it into a color image. So now you see it changed from gray. It was gray 16 before, now it's RGB 16. So Photoshop now recognizes this as a color image. And what that means is if I go over to this layers window, or this layers dialog over here, I can go into the channels, and that shows me where the color channels are. So you see now it's got, a, it's got a red channel, it's got a green channel, it's got a blue channel. The thing is, it's still the same image. So all those channels are actually the same thing. They're all the red channel because that's what they are, right? If I stretch them, if I, if I show them to you, it's all the same image, right? Whether I'm showing you the green channel or the blue channel. So what I do is, well, I want the red data to be the blue channel, or sorry, I want the red data to be the red channel. But I want the blue data to be the blue channel. So control C to copy my blue image. And I go back to my red image. And I go to the blue channel there. Control V. So go to my blue image, control C, and I go to the blue channel in the RGB image, and I do control V, and now I don't know what's happening. Yeah, no, that's not right. I'm going to start, I'm going to start, I'm going to reopen these files to see what's happening here. 
Because what it should have done is just copied the blue image into there. And I don't know why it didn't. So let me just reopen the red, green, and blue files. It seemed like it was doing a selection area, but I haven't selected anything. So I don't know what it was up to there. So it working fine yesterday. So I'm not sure what it was doing differently. Okay, so let's convert these down to 16 bits. So you leave it at grayscale? For right now, I do. Yeah, you can see this is one of the glitches that I'm running into, running, running CS2 on Windows 10. You saw how all the images disappeared there for a second. It's a Windows 10 issue. Um, so that one's 16 bit. I'll convert this one to 16 bit. Yeah, see how they disappear? You have to click on them to make them show up again. And now I'll make that one 16 bit. Okay, so now I've got red, green, and blue in 16 bit. I'm going to make my red, I'll use that as the baseline for the color image. So I convert it to RGB color. And now it's an RGB 16 rather than a gray 16. And now you can see it has color channels down here. So I'm going to leave it as the red. For the green, I'm going to go in Control A. So I'm doing it a little bit different way this time. Control A, Control C. And then I go to the green channel. And you control V. Okay, that seems to have worked at that time. Now I go to the blue channel, control A to select everything, select all, control C to copy it. I'll go back to my, my, my And then I go to, oh, oh, go to blue, thank you. Control V. Okay, that worked. Okay, so now if I flip through the different colors, I see I've got, that's the red channel, that's the green channel, slightly different. I can see the galaxy forest fainter, and there's the blue channel. Blue channel, for some reason, the whole thing is brighter, and you have to fix that up later on. So now I'm just going to change the name on this. So I have an RGB. Okay, so now we've got one color image to work with. I'll close the green since we don't need that anymore. I'll close the blue since we don't need that anymore. And now I've got this RGB image. And once I once I check all these channels to make them all active, that's what I get. But you can see, you know, the same result we had before on the, uh, the luminance image, it's basically black, so we got to stretch it. So same way we did before, I'm going to do some stretching. I'll just check the notes here. Okay. So we'll start stretching this. Same way we did before, we use curves first. Of, of this panel over on the upper right and click on the info tab then I put my mouse over here it's going to tell me what my colors are in the background so what you can see here is that for most of this black background the red has a value of about 9 the green has a value of about 5 and the blue has a value much brighter than that that's what we were seeing earlier that for whatever reason the blue data here is a lot brighter 
So what we got to do is we got to turn down, we got to tone down the blue, or we got to pull up the red and the green to match it. We're going to use the levels tool to do this. So what we're doing here is called color balancing, and this is the the first step on that route. And the way I do this in Photoshop is I use the levels tool. So let's do something else here. We're going to go back up to the histogram in the upper right, same way we had before. You can see that's basically replicated here in the levels histogram. But what we're going to do is we're going to use a different version of it. With this drop down, we're going to select colors. Ah, there they are. We're going to select the colors. So now you can see how the different colors match up. So you can see that our blue is much brighter than the red, and the green and red are overlapped here, and that's why it looks yellow there. So the green is pretty low, the red is a little higher, but the blue is way out of whack. It's too high. So the way we fix that is with levels. Go into your levels command, and you have to pick each color and work on it separately. Um, as a preliminary, we're going to pick a we're going to pick an eyedropper tool from over here. And we're going to pick a color sampler. What the color sampler does is you can set it out on your image, and it'll show you for that particular sampler. There's sampler number one. That's what it's reading there. Eight for red, five for green, thirty for blue. I'll set another one over here. Nine for red, five for green, and thirty for blue again. So fairly consistent for what we're seeing. You can set up four of these, and you can see they're giving us very similar results across the whole frame. So what we're going to do is we want those numbers to all match up because black space should be black, right? I mean, or at least neutral gray it should be. So we're going to try and pull down the blue so it, and, and, and make it match up with, with what we get for red and green. And the way we do that is with the levels tool. I'll go back up here. Well, let's stay on info for right now so you can see how these numbers are changing. So the first thing we want to work on is blue because blue is too bright. You grab the black point, and you slide it up here. You see how the numbers, this is pre-adjustment pre with levels, this is post-adjustment with levels. What you want to do is you want to have these three numbers in this column, you want to have them match up. So blue is the most out of whack, so that's the one I worked on first. And I had to drag the, the blue point up from 0 to 26. Uh, to get it down to five, and that's you know five, 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 four. You can look at that. That's fine. So, but now let's adjust the red a little bit too, because that's also a little too high. I have to do that gently. Mm, let's do that. That's probably the best. Um, so I just push the red up a little bit. I want to push up. Four, whereas the blue I could push up to what, 26, because for whatever reason the blue was a lot brighter. So what I've done is I've made the color as neutral black as I can. That's why I'm just going to call this uh, black point. You can label these in case you want to go back to each of these layers later on and make some adjustments with it. You'll know what you're doing. Okay, so now I've given it a neutral background, and now what I do is I start stretching. Same way we did with the luminance frame. We'll go to curves. Pull up. Fine. Not seeing anything for that first one. Let's do another one. Pull the curves up further. Okay. Starting to see some. But your because your color data is so much fainter than your luminance data, it will take more work to make this happen. Right now we're starting to get somewhere, the galaxy is starting to show up. Again, you see that posterizing in there. Let's uh, make this a little bit bigger. Okay, that got us past the posterizing. You see the, the colors do not look right, right? The galaxy looks yellow, green. Um, background sky, how are we doing for background sky right now? Um, I've got the sampler out here that shows me what the, the background sky looks like. It looks like it's too green right now. Red needs to come up maybe a 
tiny bit too. So maybe I'll do another one of those, those black point levels adjustments you know, to, to try and get these, these sliders to, to all match up again. As you can see, the green now has started to get too high, and the red is maybe a tiny bit too low. So let's go to green. We'll pull up the black point again a little bit. So we get it down to maybe 45, let's say. Yeah. So you see, it's not going to be the same everywhere now. You have you have to start making some compromises now. Um, I think maybe the blue ought to come down slightly to match up with where the red is. Green still seems a little high. Maybe one little more adjustment. Oh, okay, that's probably the best we're going to do. So you can see what we've done here is again with this this the second color levels adjustment. We've again we've tried to neutralize the, the colors in our four sample points here so that they all have the same background. You want to make sure those four points you select, you may want to do to make sure they're not in an area that does have a color. So, yes, that's what we're going to get to next. Because you're going to find this is one of the advantages that PixInsight has over Photoshop. You would have taken care of all of that already. And you wouldn't have to worry about that. So, uh, what Chris is talking about here is that you may have a gradient across your image. No, actually, I'm talking, you may have had a, um, you may have picked a point that inadvertently was in part of the nebulosity. Oh, part of the galaxy, galaxy. yeah. Okay, that's that, a good that, point. That, that, that does have color, and now you're essentially trying to take that away. Yeah, that's a good point. So we can go back and we can review our, um, uh, our, our color samplers and make sure that you didn't like accidentally put it over a faint star or something, um, or, or over a galaxy halo that you hadn't noticed before. Here, I think, it looks to me like we're pretty far away uh, from anything that would be uh, structure from your image. Um, what I was talking about was one of the other issues that you may run into is light pollution gradients or color gradients across your image, particularly if you shot across multiple nights, if you have you know, a little bit of moonlight in one and not in others, if you, know, if, you, if you shoot across several hours, the sky glow from Washington is going to be on the left-hand side of some images and on the bottom of other images. And what that means is that the left-hand side of some images is going to be yellow, but the bottom of some other images is going to be yellow. And you're going to, when you stack all that data together, you're going to wind up with gradients, and they're not necessarily going to be a nice, smooth, linear gradient from one corner to the other. There are going to be blue patches here, yellow patches there. And this color data is particularly horrible. And that's part of the reason that I chose it, because I didn't want to bring in the, a perfect set of, of data and, and process that, because you don't see any problems with that. Yeah. Um, I wanted to bring in like an average set of data. I shoot through light polluted skies, which is why most of the time I'm shooting with narrow band filters to solve that problem. But I shoot through light polluted skies when I'm doing LRGB imaging like this, too. And there's no, well, realistically, there's no cure for that. You just got to deal with the light pollution later on in processing. So that's what we're running into here. You're going to discover that as we stretch this color data, you start to see horrible blue and yellow splotchiness in the background. And we're going to work on how to deal with that. But the issue is, it's in the data. That's the problem that you have. Um, but our sample points, for right now, our sample points look like they're, they're in about the right positions. And so I'm going to zoom back in here to get this posterization. A quick question. Right now, are you manipulating the, the red, blue, green at the same time? You're just doing different things with those? You're, you're just, just, yeah, this working is just those three? All three of them are being you're adjusted pulling at the same them. time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, what we're starting to see is that the galaxy itself looks way too yellow. There's a couple of ways to deal with that. Let me just look back at my notes and see how I did it.
Yeah, I started doing some, some curves with colors. So let's do that. So Kevin, would you remind me, at this point you're just dealing with the color channels, you haven't added luminance yet? That's right. Okay. That's right. We're going to put the luminance in at the very last step here on top of this data. So um, I think I'm going to do one more, cur one more normal curve here to brighten this up just a little bit more. That's good. And then I'll do a level here to just a levels command to, to pull the black point down because it's really starting to get a little too bright. And yeah, I'm starting to clip off some of the data there, but that's okay. This, the data that's on this end of the histogram is almost always just going to be junk. I mean, this is black here. This is the background here. So the stuff that's over here isn't really anything at all. Kevin, and is there a reason not to put luminance in, don't you? Oh, I will. I'll, the luminance gets added in at the end. Yeah, no, I understand. But if you added it in now, then could you adjust the sky glow and all that out bright as you Yeah, did? you could, but I it's easier. I, I've always found it easier to, to stretch first, stretch my luminance separately from my RGB first. And then once, I, once I've got them stretched roughly the way I like, then put them together and then start doing the, the final touch-ups like that, like dealing with gradients and things like that. But I find if I try and do it first, it just never really works out for me. I always wind up in some dead-end street that I you know, can't seem to get out of. All right, so I, I've, I've darkened up the background here with this, this last levels curve. Um, but what I want to do now is I want to get rid of this color because it looks awful. And so in Photoshop, what I have to do is go back into the curves command. And I think what I'm going to try and do here uh, is it, it's not the background here that I'm worried about so much, it's the galaxy itself, it's yellow. And in particular with this galaxy, it's blue, it's supposed to be blue anyway. Um, it has kind of a whitish or yellowish or even reddish core, but these arms ought to be, for the most part, they ought to be blue. It's a spiral galaxy. So the way I'm going to do that is, and this is probably the trickiest part of processing with Photoshop, is fixing your colors. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull down the green just slightly. What I'm really going to do, though, is I'm going to push the blue. And the blue, I'm going to have to do a lot. So that's where, that's where my spiral arms are, right about there. And I want them to be blue. But you can see that as I start doing that, all the background starts turning blue, too. So what I need to do is try and get blue there, and yet keep the background down where it's dark. So the background is over in here. So I'm going to pull that way. I'm just going to try and smooth this curve out so I don't wind up with anything that looks wildly crazy. And you can see that the core is getting red now, which is not making me happy. Maybe I pulled down the green a little bit too far. Let's see, I've got too much red up here. So let's pull the red down a little too. Now we're starting to get a little bit better. So this is the trickiest part for me of processing in Photoshop. Um, you'll see that you don't have to do any of this, or at least not most of this, uh, in, in PixInsight. It really is a, an easier process. Um, but I've mostly gotten through what I want to do here. I'd say that's probably about the best I'm going to get for, for color balance. So click OK to that. But we have different versions of Photoshop, but if you were to if you would hit Control M right now. Control M? Yeah. Okay, here's the, the version of CS CS3, the version that I have shows a histogram. Yeah. You do an RGB color or whatever. Yeah, the, this right so so what Bob's talking about is newer versions of Photoshop here. They'll show you the histogram right here on the curves tool. So you can see where there's a red yeah. red's too hot or blue's too hot. Okay. And it, it does make it easier because Really what you're trying to do, in fact, let me show you this. You can, you can what you're really trying to do there. is, see this histogram there. over here there. with the colors? There what you you're go. really trying to do is get these three peaks to line up. There's blue, you can see red is over here, and there's some overlapping colors here in the middle. 
And so what we really want to do, if we were really doing it right, we would go into this curve that we pulled up, and we would, sometimes you got to click this warning box here to get the, the current view. What we do is we would try and adjust this a little bit. It's tricky though, because with, with the newer version that you're looking at, Bob, you get more data here, so it's easier to see what's going on. And in my sense is here, I've made this too blue, but it's tricky with the limited view you get from the histogram to see when you've got it exactly right. So that's probably about the best I can do for right now. I doubt I'm going to get an outcome too much better than that without, with some more fiddling I would, but that's probably about the best I can get. And even still, you can see the blue is, is you pretty the high. Whole, you have the whole spectrum of your book. So. What's that? If you click on the just blue? Uh, curves again and just pull your blue channel all the way, not all the way down, but down from the center instead of having the, the X curve that you had. So do a new curve? Do the, no, no. Go to the blue. All right. Adjusting curve, blue channel. Lower. Well, if I do that, though, yeah, that will definitely pull over the blue. But then you see I start running the to problems with the galaxy arms starting to, to yellow up again which is really not what I want. I'll say that I'll say that I did a better job when I was doing this at home. I'll show it to you. And I wound up I wound up with that. And maybe it's because I pushed a little bit further and I did more curves. Let's try one more curve here and brighten things up and see where we are. So we have a, a background that's going way up. So let's uh, let's drag the blue point down in the background again. So just like we did before with levels, we pull that blue point down. That looks a little bit better. Still high in some areas. Your center character. Well, the problem when you start doing that, you can do that, you can adjust that. It does seem like it looks a little bit better. Let's go with that for right now. If it doesn't work out, I'll, do the, I'll show you the processing I did at home. Um, why don't we leave it? Why don't we leave it with this for right now? You can see the process of fixing your colors in, in Photoshop is hard. It'll, there will be challenges with this data in PixInsight too, but in Photoshop it's tricky. You know, I, I always find it challenging. And it's more of an art form. It is. Because you just kind of look and see what looks good. It is. You know, and, and the people, people when they get started on processing will say, you know, hey, how do I know when I'm done stretching? And the answer is you're done stretching when you feel like you're done stretching. There's, there's, no, there's no, okay, clearly I've got it right now. It's just what, to you, looks like, well, that seems to be about the best I can do. Okay, so we've got our color image here. I've got, I opened up my luminance image. Let's, I think I opened up my luminance image, right? There it is. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to copy my luminance image. So Control A, Control C. And I'll go back to the color image that we're working on here, which is RGB2. And I'm simply going to plop it in right on top there. So you can see the, the, the black and white image is there, and the color data is below it. So this layer up here is my luminance data. So I'm just going to call it luminance. And if I want to, to, to make this color merge, I have to go up here into this little dialog box above the layers, and I have to click the drop-down tag and set it as luminosity. And what that's telling Photoshop is, that's just my luminance layer. So that's where my definition comes in, my data comes in, but it's not the color. The color is all this stuff down below it. And you can see, if we just lay it out that way, that's what we get. And you know, I agree that I think it looks a little too red in the core and through the arms here. But again, 
you know, that's some work that, that, will, that will solve that problem eventually. Um, These and are all four together. These are all... Kevin, remind us how, how to uh, join the luminance layer with the rest of the layers. So you just copy the luminance layer from out of its own image. Okay. And then you go back into your in your color image, which was our, our right. RGB image here. So we did a control A and then... Yeah, and then you do, just do control V. It's to paste. Oh. And in Photoshop, what paste does is it creates a new level, a new, sorry, a new layer on top of this. So that's what this, when we, <coughs> this is where we were before on the color image. And then we copied the luminance layer and we went in, back into our color image and we hit control V and it created this layer up on top here, which is the luminance data. Yeah. And if I was just looking at it as a normal image like this, you see, that's, that's a luminance. So black and white, that's all there is to it. But if I tell Photoshop, no, this is what, this is what in astronomy you call an LRGB image, but I, in order to tell Photoshop that, I have to open that drop-down box again and make it luminosity. And now it uses the luminance layer basically for like contrast and resolution and data, but it uses the colors and it puts the colors on top here. And so here's the image that you have. That's your final result. You can see there's lots of problems here. The biggest problem, I'm going to have to downsize it to, to make it visible to you because otherwise we'll run into the pixelation problem. Okay, you can see the biggest, the biggest problem you have is it's way too bright up at the top. And it's way too dark down the bottom. That's a that's a really nice gradient over it, and you can see in addition that there are blue patches and there are yellow patches. They shouldn't be like that. So what we can do is we can throw in another levels command at the top here, and we can try and start. We can try and, try and start clipping some of these shadows because really it's black space. There shouldn't be anything there at all. So with this levels command, we can try and grab the levels and drag it over until the background starts darkening up. I mean, at some point, you're going to start losing detail in your galaxy, which you don't want. But it's going to look better than it did before. So that's with the levels command, making it a little bit darker. You can see how much brighter it is. You know, but on the other hand, you're starting to make some compromises around the, the halo of the galaxy here. But you know, for a first image, this is good. This is, you know, if this is the first time you've run through this, you're doing fine. This is, you can take this and you can work with this. Once you learn how to do more in processing, you can come back to this data and you can work on it again. Um, the, the, the truth is, you only need to go back to the masters. You don't need to restack all the data. That's, you're, you're probably done with that as long as you, as long as you get it right. There's, there's, there's very little that gets tweaked in stacking. The tweaking is done in this post-processing stage. So you've you worked on an LRGB uh, set of data. Uh, if, what is the difference if you have a DSLR, you know, a, a, a one-shot color type of uh, data? Um, so the only thing that would be different would be that you don't have to go through the color merchant that we did. You would have when for your output from Deep Sky Stacker, you just have one image, not four, and so you wouldn't have to do that color merge that we did at the beginning of the Photoshop right. process. But then, how do you how do you adjust the different colors? Same way that we did. Same way. At least that's that's the way I would do it. You know, is to to adjust the level the black points with levels, and then adjust the um, uh, adjust the the data. You know, really get in there and mess around with curves. Pixinsight seems to do that all sort of in the background. That is, Some of it, yeah. Well, let's, let's go over into Pixinsight and we'll, we'll see how things work differently there. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start from the beginning in Pixinsight. I'll show you how you stack in Pixinsight, and then I'll show you how you stretch in Pixinsight. The stacking in Pixinsight, at least in, <coughs> at the beginner level, the stacking in Pixinsight is done through, is done through a script called batch pre-processing. So you go up to script, batch processing, and it's over here in batch pre-processing. So that'll call up this dialog box. And into this dialog box, you put all your images. 
flats, darks, biases, lights, they all go in here. So you can just click add files. This is all the raw data for Pixinsight. I, I just set it in a separate file so it would be easier. But you can see in this one folder, I've got lights, biases, colors, you know, with color filters, uh, flats for each color, darks. It's all there. Everything is in there. And I just hit OK. And hey, here's my lights tab. Pixinsight knew that those ones are luminance frames. It knew that these ones are blue frames. It knew these ones are green. Uh, in my flats, it knew which filters were used with which flats. My darks, it knows what all those are. My biases, it knows what all those are. I don't have to go through the, the, the trouble of telling it, this is this, this is this, this is this. Run them all separately, stack them all up. It will know all this stuff for you. Now, and that is... How does it know that? Does it get it from the file that you have to get it, or does it get it, it, it got it from... It got it when the data was created, when the data was captured by your capture program. So sequence generator will capture this way, Max and DL will capture this way. I'm just taking pictures from, and like I can take a DSLR picture, so it's not going to know whether it's flat or not. It depends. If you have raw files, you're going to have to it. Well, that, so that's something that I'm not clear on. I, my, my sense is that there is a way with backyard EOS or sequence generator to tell it I am capturing a flat now, I am capturing a bias. But again, you know, having not these, you were able to do this, right, Chow? Yeah, but I can see I can see it, an Astro camera maybe having, you know, some something in the back end of it that would that would flag those files. But I believe that backyard EOS has this capability, but again, have not used it so I don't know. Oh backyard EOS that just this five. Yeah, so, so at the time that you're capturing, whether it's backyard EOS or sequence generator, you know, you have to make sure that you tell it, I am capturing bias now, I am capturing darks now. Um, but as long as you do that, from then on, the processing software will know what type of frame this is, what filter it was used with, how long the exposure was. Um, it'll know later on if you want to combine 2 minute and 20 minute exposures, it'll know which one was which. You know, so all of that is taken into account, so you don't have to go through this, you know, one at a time process that you went through in Deep Sky Stacker. Um, batch pre-processing and Pix Insight knows it all. Um, so basically, I've loaded all in all my data here. Um, here, I want to. I'm in my I'm in my tab for lights up here. You know, this is the only tab that I need to adjust because I want to tell it what to do with my lights. Now I want it to I want it to register my images, uh, and it's they're all set, so that should be good. I'll look at my registration parameters. That looks good. Kevin, forgive me. Are these the XSIF files that you loaded, or did you? Load yeah, them these on? are these are XSIF files, but um, well, actually. Fitch. These are fits. Fits yeah. files. These are fits files. XISF doesn't get generated until Pixinsight starts running right. and making its own files. You don't have to convert the fits to XSIF. No. No. Right. Pixinsight is perfectly comfortable with fits files. So um, check my registration parameters. There, you, you, you're not going to need to change anything here. Yeah. The files will be fine. Uh, well, yeah, but I mean, it depends on how bad your data is. If this is the first time you're using Pixinsight, and that's what I'm focusing on here, you'll be fine. Um, you won't know that you have that data. Now, so the one thing that you want to check here under image integration, you want to click apply here. Um, you can look at your integration parameters, but basically, if this is set, sorry, if this is set to Windsorize signal clipping here, that's probably what you want to use. So. You know, as long as you've got, say, 20 light frames, Windsor Eyes Sigma Clipping is almost certainly what you want to use. And if it's not, it'll still work out fine. For your first image, this will be fine. We'll close that. So we're set, we're almost set with, to run batch pre-processing here. If you have a color camera, you have, to, you have to click CFA for color filter array. You may have to mess around here with the, the mosaic pattern and the Bebear method. Again, that's something that you'll need to check with the camera manufacturer or other people who use your camera. Hopefully you can just click CFA 
and this auto function here will run everything for you. Um, but again, have not used this with, uh, with a color camera. Um, if you're using masters, like a master bias or dark or flat, you need to tell Pix and Psych that. Um, but otherwise, it's going to assume that these are all just raw flats and raw biases, and it'll create the masters for you. Um, last step, I want to pick a registration reference frame, and I want to tell it where to output the data. So I'm just going to I'm going to save my work right here. And the way I do that is I grab this little tiny uh, triangle at the lower left and drop it onto the screen. And what that did, it created a process. Oops, sorry, it created a process icon that I can go back to and use later on. So the reason I'm doing that is because I want to run this tool called Blink to show you how it works. So go process. And what I've done here is I loaded in my light frames, just my lights, I, I, don't, I didn't put the color frames in here, because I want to get a, a rough idea, first, are any of these crap that I should just exclude from the stack? So just scroll through them here, it's showing you a preview here of what this will look like if it's stretch. You can see they all look fine. In fact, I can barely even tell any difference between any of them, they all look fine. Um, so, but you want to do that to make sure that there are no bad frames in there, so you know to exclude them. You also want to get a sense of which one should I pick to be my registration frame. Because just like we did with Deep Sky Stacker, everything is going to get aligned to one of these pictures. So, I'll just use frame 11 as the registration frame. Oh, it's fine. I don't see anything. You drag the process down, and what should you write after that? Because I'm going to follow all that. Um, it's all processes at the top. So, I dragged this process and I just dropped it over here. <laughs> And then I went up to <coughs> process to, to open the blink. Go up here to process and then pick all processes. And then it'll show everything. You have to close the, you have to close the file dialog. Yes, you do. You have to close the script dialog. Scripts are like that. Scripts are type of metal. And you can't do anything else while a script dialog is open and fixed inside. Okay. Processes are more forgiving. But for whatever reason, scripts have to be shut down before you can move to anything else. Okay, and then from the process, you chose? I chose Blink. All processes, and that will open up all the processes that you can use in Blink as one of them. There are different ways to get these processes and scripts open. You can go over here to Process Explorer instead. Okay. It'll you know, show them down here. You can, you can pick them from here, but yeah, usually I just go up here, all processes, plug blink. And so blink just shows me, it lets me look and I, I pick the one I want. And here, let's just go to frame 11, that looks fine. So I'm going to close blink. Okay. Yeah. When you got the blink open, how do you get the result file? Oh, you gotta, you got to open it. Yeah, see that folder icon down there? Yeah. You click on that, and you just... Open a list of files, and it'll add to those. And it'll show them all to you. And it's giving you a little preview here, so you get some sense. Yeah, you can see the blue one is much darker. It's giving you a little preview. Yes. What? You don't need to say it anymore. here. No, it's okay. And again, remember, we can show you this later on. Once, once we get to it. The, the process, the blink process is not really that critical. You're just figuring out what your frames look like and if anyone, any of them you want to throw out. So we're going to go back where we were to our, our batch pre-processing, which is the stacking and calibration. We'll open that back up. Remember, we saved that little icon over here. So what I did was, what I did was I just went back in and I, I reopened that icon. Click on this little button and it will reopen. Can we talk about the screen, the basic screen, for just a second? Yeah. You have that line on the right hand side. Is there any functional difference between the right side of that line and the left side, or is it just a place to store these categories? You mean the, this is no, the right hand side of the screen? Notice that you've got that line there. I don't is there know any functional difference? Things over there? 
just a place to put stuff. Do you know what it means, Kyle? I've, I've never put yeah. a pencil in there. You can, you can drag, 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 or right. Just, just um, let you to put those um, um, processes lined up so easier for you to bend. There's no functional difference. It's just a, no. it's no, just, just a line there so you can say you can line up your your left side or right side to that line. So it doesn't make a difference in where on the screen. Okay. It's, like, it's like a ruler almost. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right. So go back to batch pre-processing where we were. Um, and so you can see we've, you know, we've, we've, we've got all our, all our information. It's all loaded up. It's all teed up and ready to go here. Just the last two things we do, we need to tell it what we want it to register to. And we decided frame 11 was fine. And we need to tell it where, it wants to, where the output should go. And you can see I've got PI output set up here as, as where I want it to go. Do you use the same output directory all the time, or do you change it for each? No, I set up a new one for each target I'm processing, okay. so, that, so that I don't clutter it up. Okay. I mean, you can do it any way you want. It's just organizationally, I find it easier for me to set up, you know, keep everything separate for every target I process. Will it overwrite things if you don't do that? No. Now, if, if it does, it will come back and give you a warning that it's doing that. You'll be able to see that it did it, and you know, then you can, you can rewrite it the way you want and get it back. Um, but yeah, that, that is one reason not to try and do that if you've got the same file names, that I think it will overwrite for you. So I mean, it's not going to go back and destroy your original data as long as you're not saving in the, the raw data file. That's why I always try and, and save to a different place. So I keep my raw data separate from my, my process data. So I have two, two separate folders for them. Yeah. So everything is set here and ready to go. And um, click that diagnostic button first. It'll tell you all the things that you're doing wrong. Um, and what you can see here is it's telling me that it doesn't want me to use Windsorized signal clipping because I don't have enough frames in there. True. That's because I've only got five frames in a set. And that's not enough to run Windsorized signal clipping. It wants it to stack in a different way. Um, but you guys will have more than five frames when you're, when you're running this through. Um, if you don't set it for average rather than Windsorized signal clipping, you'll, you'll be fine. That's, again, that's down here in the integration parameters. So just rather than using Windsorized signal clipping, just set it to, well, I guess, I guess in this case, you have to set it to like low rejection. Because what this is doing is controlling hot pixels. With only five frames, I think signal clipping would still be okay. Yeah, signal clipping works with fewer frames. Windsorized is the one that requires Yeah, it might. It might. Um, if you have a lot of frames, use linear fit clipping. You know, once you get over 25, I think they say you should use linear fit clipping. I find, you know, again, it's one of those 1% differences. But generally, you know, Windsor Eyes Sigma clipping is probably going to work out fine for you. You, you shouldn't have any trouble with it. Um, and then uh, click Run. And when you do that, you'll see, it'll give you the warnings again. But, um, if I continue, you should tell me the date. Yes, here it is. Okay, so um, one of the things that it will tell you is it will give you this warning. And it will basically it'll say, do not integrate your, your images with this batch preprocessing script. And there's a reason for that. They want you to go over to and use a separate tool called image integration because it gives you more control over signal clipping. You, can, you have better control over hot pixels there. This is the first time you've used PixInsight. Ignore this warning and stack this way. You'll be fine. So I am not actually going to do this because it would take a long time uh, to run all this. But you can see that once you set it up to start going, it will give you lots of information about what it's doing here. And as you get more experience with PixInsight, you will be able to go back into this record. It keeps it here so you can open it up again and see what it did. And if it ran into any problems, it'll, it'll post all that here. So this is almost like this is like a processing log. And you can go back into this processing log at any time you want. If you come down later on and say, something went wrong here, you can go back into that processing log and try and figure out what it was. So go off, make a sandwich, come back, and you're, uh, you're processing.
processing that we got. So I'm just going to abort it here because this would this would take too long. Yeah, you can see it, it doesn't like what I've done here for it. Um, but fortunately, I have the masters elsewhere. So that's what I'm going to do in this workspace. Um, you see that PixInsight allows you to have different workspaces where you get different things done. So that was the calibration workspace. I, I give all mine names. And it's kind of like you get a new desktop to, so you can keep clean. I'm going to go into the Luminance desktop. Uh, and we'll start doing, uh, we'll start working on the Luminance image here. So again, go up and just open my image. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me let me go back. Yeah. So one thing I'll show you is a convenience that you get out of Photoshop or out of um, PixInsight is that I send all the data to this PixInsight output file, and what you'll see is that PixInsight creates this nice folder structure for you in case you ever need to go back and fix anything. It did your calibration and it created a whole bunch of calibrated images here for you. That's what the C at the end of the file name means. So it took each one of your images that, that you, you know, calibrated against bias, darks, flats, uh, and it created a calibrated version of it. And if you look again, you'll see that there's another file here called register. It took the calibrated images and it registered them against the reference frame and created another set of output files called CR, means calibrated and registered. And if you look back in here, it took all of those and it, it, it stacked them all up and it created masters for you. Now, not only did it create your master luminance and master green and blue and red, but it created master flats. So there's your blue flat master, there's your green flat master. It created a master dark. It created a master bias. And here's my light masters, red, blue, green, blue. So if you need to go back to these masters at any point, or if you need to get into those intermediate calibration frames or registration frames, you can do that. It also let you go back and see, was there a mistake? Do I only have one calibration frame? If you do, something went wrong. Um, and you can see that in the log that we were showing. But it may be easier just to open up your, your output files and see, am I, am I finding here what I expect to find? But here I did. I got my masters all stacked up. So this light filter loom binning, that's my master, because it's in my master's folder. So that's the stack of, in this case, it's about 400 uh, luminance frame images. Uh, all calibrated and lined up, one data point ready to, ready to put out and uh, show me how to work on it. So let me, I've opened it up here, uh, and the first step I'm going to do here is I'm going to crop off some of this junk. So this is a preview. Again, PixInsight is stretching this in a way that you don't really need to, uh, uh, it's not doing anything with the data, it's just a preview. It hasn't changed the data in any way. But you can see, like, I've got these bad registration errors here, and it's just going to be a pain to process those. I was able to salvage a lot of this in the processing I did at home and you know, get some of these galaxies off the side, but we don't need to do that here. So what we're going to do is the first step is crop. So you go up to your processes and you go to dynamic crop. And what I'll do is I click on that image. So go to dynamic crop, and I drag and drop an outline of parts that I'd like to keep. And you can adjust that. So you grab grab one what edge of the window, and you can move it where you want. Tilt it. I'm just trying to crop off some of the junk here so we don't have to struggle with it as we're doing the rest of the processing. Pull up a corner. You can rotate this too if you want. If you really wanted to, you can rotate it off. I mean, I don't really see any need to do that here. Um, the key is, though, this is your luminance frame, and you want to make, because your red, green, and blue have all been aligned to this, you want to save this cropping tool and make sure that you can apply it to your red, green, and blue going forward. 
And the way we do that is, is we just grab, just like we saved an icon before, grab the little triangle down at the lower left here, and just leave it on the screen. Okay? We'll get back to that in a few minutes. So I'm just going to go ahead and execute it. You see it cropped my frame for me, cropped off a bunch of the junk, so we don't have to deal with that now. And this saved cropping icon, I'm going to just right click on it, change the name, crop. And right click on it again, and I'm going to send it over to the workspace where I do my color images, which is uh, RGB linear. When we get there, you'll see it, that icon is ready, ready and waiting for me there. If you hit Control-0, by the way, it'll resize your image automatically to, to fit the screen the best it can. Um, so, the thing is, this isn't what my image looks like. It's still... <coughs> you can do these screen previews. Control-A will kind of show you what the screen looks like as a preview, and to get rid of it to show you what it really looks like, Control-F12. That's what it is. That's what it looks like right now. Control A. So that's just a preview of what you're seeing. So what I want to do now is I want to get rid of some of this background here. This is the first magic tool that you're going to see in PixInsight, a process called dynamic background extraction. And what I do with this, click on the center of the image, and dynamic background extraction, click generate over here, what it's going to do is it's going to generate a bunch of sample points all across the image that give it a sense of what am I looking for, what's the background of this image. I'm sorry, how did you do that? So you click on this generate yeah. button here. First thing you got to do when you, you open dynamic background extraction, click on the image so it knows right. what in, image you're interested in. And then you click on generate down here <laughs> under sample generation. Now, this is not enough sample points. Because you can see there are no sample points at all over here. What you want to do is get a sample point over the background, sample points all over the background of the image. And so I've got enough samples per row. Basically, what that means is it'll get me, it'll get 10 samples across here and 10 samples down. So this samples per row is 10, and that's fine. Um, what I want to do though is I need to get more samples. Right now, this is the only place that it can put samples based on these parameters, because it's avoiding stars, it's avoiding my galaxy, which I want it to do, but I want it to get more of the background. So, excuse me, I ease up on these parameters. The first one that I usually change is minimum sample weight. Um, I will admit that there are not a lot of instructions on how to use um, uh, dynamic background extraction and how exactly to set these parameters. Um, in Warren Keller's book, you'll find some. Online, you'll find some. Um, so I'm doing what works for me, but what works for you may be different numbers in these, in these areas. So if I change, the default here is 0.75. If I change it down to 0 0.1 and click Generate again, you can see I've got a lot more sample points. In fact, that may be, well, it's not quite all the ones I need. See how these ones are red? That means that they're not working. It put out sample points, but it's not going to use them. So it's not going to recognize that's background. So I need to increase the tolerance up here, and I move that up to 1. And then again, click Generate, and now it's happy with these ones. So now I've got nice, smooth uh, background sample point. Almost all of them are on the background, but there's one here and here. They're both red right now, so maybe they're not going to be used. But just to be safe, I'm going to delete them because I want to make sure that they're not going to get used. Because what you're telling the computer here is, all of this stuff is background. And I can see that there's halo from the galaxy over these sample points. And I can either delete them like this, or I can grab hold of them, and I can drag them and move them somewhere else. So I'm going to move some of these, some of these sample points off, and I'm going to delete some others, because I just don't need those ones. Okay, so that looks pretty good. I'm pretty happy with what I'm seeing there. I, I think I've got sample points from places that I need. Right? 
right? Yeah, that all looks good. So I'm going to close some of these extra dialog boxes. If you had a big screen at home, you would if you get to see all of this, you wouldn't have to fiddle around quite the way I am. But with the projector, there's only so much we have. So what I want to do is I want to subtract the background from this, and only the background. So I want to subtract only the background. So I set the correction here to be subtraction. <coughs> and then I just click the check mark here to run it. And what it does is it looks at each of those sample points and says, this is background for this image. It created a new image for me, but it also created a background uh, set so I can see, I'm going to save this icon. So again, I want to save my dynamic background extraction. So I grabbed the triangle and just dragged it and set it on the desktop there. So now I can close it. You can see I've still got the icon there. So if I need to do something else with it, it's ready, ready to go. So this is my background, and once I do the control A to preview it, that's the background that got subtracted out of that image. And that looks right to me. And that's the, you know, basically what I expected to see. So the new image with the background extracted now looks like that. And you can see that it's a lot more smooth than it used to be, because before, it's also a lot more stretched, because it can be more stretched. The auto stretch, the preview stretch that we did, will make it brighter and pull out more background. You can see that the galaxy halo really stands out. Now that extra stretch also has the disadvantage of accenting the noise. But again, this is all just preview. Nothing, the data hasn't been changed here. But you can see, comparing it to the original image here, shrink this and get a better, better view. You can see that this gradient, how it fades almost to black down here, is now mostly taken care of. Um, so a lot, of the, a lot of the ugliness is now out of this image. Because it's extra stretched here, it looks noisy, but it's really no more noisy than this image. It's just that now, because you're able to stretch it, you're seeing that noise. But we've taken out the background. And the part of the sort of squirrely looking things uh, on the left hand side that you can't detect. Oh yeah, those are, those are dust donuts. Okay. Infamous, especially with an SCT. Those are on my chip. And that's, that's one of the reasons that if you take your camera off and put it back on for the next session, your flats are not going to work. For me, my camera stays attached all the time so I can get away with it. The flat hasn't been processed yet? It's used a master flat. So the flat has been processed, but I've, I've used the same flat against 20 nights a day. But that's because my scope stays in my observatory and doesn't move. Well, I think his question is why aren't those removed? Oh, why? well, so they aren't removed because it's not perfect. It's really, okay, so the reason these aren't removed is these are really bad dust specs. And I really should just go to the trouble of taking my camera off and cleaning it. But like I lasted that like four years ago, and it's a pain. And you know, you've got to be meticulous and careful and stuff. And this can be cleaned up in Photoshop. So, but yeah, <laughs> I really, I really ought to find a convenient breaking point, take the camera off, you know, bring it inside, hook it up to my spotting telescope so I can see where it is, you know, get out the cleaning solution and clean those dust donuts off. So you can fix inside to get rid of those? It is. But this, if I hadn't used these flats, this image would look horrid. Oh, I, I, you would see I dust donuts all if, through it. If, uh, but is there a method in uh, PixInsight to, to deal with the with the uh, perfections that are there now? Yeah, so in the, the end... You mentioned that Photoshop, you can do it in Photoshop, but... Uh, well, in the end, we'll talk about how I do it. Right now, I do it in Photoshop. I take it at the very end, I take this, the finished image back into Photoshop, and I just subtract the background out of it. I make what's called an artificial flat. You can do it in PixInsight too. It's just, I'm not as skilled at doing it in PixInsight, but it can definitely be done in PixInsight. Yeah, yeah. It'd be, it'd, be, it'd be nice if we all had perfect flats and never had any problems, and they sucked all our dust donuts out. But yeah, they they don't always. Particularly when you stretch it this hard, you know, it's every flaw in this image is going to be noticeable when you do it this way. 
All right, let me just see if there's anything else I want to do in this linear processing script part. No, we're done. Okay, so we're going to save this. So, I didn't see this directory in the zip files that you sent, the, the PI output. There were just, there were all the files. You didn't see the master's directory? No. Huh. Oh, there's a master's directory. That's where this is, yeah, the master's directory. The PI output I just created while I was processing. So the oh, pixel okay. would have a place to put its intermediate gotcha. trains. Gotcha. Okay. So we'll just say this is noon final three. Since three seems to be what we're using, I think. Okay, so now we're gonna go over into the next workspace to start stretching. So luminance stretching. And that's just the image that I already worked on. Another question. Yeah. So, uh, after if we had run the whole batch pre-processing, which we didn't wait for it to finish, uh, would it have only produced one luminance? So, so out of that whole yeah, directory you would get, that it you would get one luminance, one blue, one red, one green. Yeah. Okay. And, and they would they would be in a, a folder called masters. I I tried to open. Uh, a file out of that, and I kick in this error that says uh, uh, can't recognize or can't figure out what what, uh, what kind of file it is. I don't know what that is. I'll oh, take a look at that. Yeah, yeah, those are fix inside. Uh, fix inside. Yeah. Using the file open. I'll take a look at it later. All right. So we're we're over here, and we're going to start stretching our luminance image. So again, preview. That's what it looks like. But what it really looks like, control F12, that's what it looks like. So black, black sky, lots of stars. So stretching and pixel insight, I use the histogram transformation tool mostly. And you can see this is very much like the levels tool in Photoshop. Now why do histogram here and curves in Photoshop? I'm not sure. It just seems to work better. And histogram is certainly what everyone recommends for, uh, uh, for pixel insight. So what you do is you just grab this, this gray point in the middle here. Oh, we'll first click this, the, this little circle down here. It'll give you a preview so you can see what's happening as you're, as you're dragging. So grab this little uh, slider in the middle here. That's your gray point. And I start pushing it over to the left end of the histogram. You can see things start brightening up, right? So that'll be the first one. And you go back down here, and that neutralizes your settings again. So this is what we've got right now. What did you just do? I went down here to the lower right, and that, that resets everything back to neutral. So I applied it once by clicking the square here. So this is my preview image. The image that I'm, that I'm working on is down here. This is my preview image here. So I'm going to do a little bit more. I'm going to make it a little bit brighter, maybe up to there. Let's say we're satisfied with that. So click on the black, click on the blue square. That will apply it. You get over applied because this is my this is my preview image here. But you can see it applied it here to my working image. But my preview here still has these settings. So I just turn them back to neutral. So that's what I got. I think I'm happy with that for, for histogram transformation. So now I'm going to, so here's where we are with our stretched image. I'm going to go to process, I'm going to do a little bit more with curves. Hey Mike, can you just check for me and make sure how we're doing on time? Make sure, I want to make sure that we're not taking somebody's room from them. So here I'm going to go to Curves Transformation, very similar to Photoshop. And if I click this, I click this little check mark here. This, this returns everything to neutral. It resets all the settings. And if I click the little check mark that's down here next to it, that puts my histogram in. And you, so you can see the peak of my histogram, through what I did with levels, has already been moved a little bit. It used to be way over here, and it's moved over here. And the galaxy is in this part of the histogram. And what I want to do is I want to brighten up this part because I want to make my galaxy brighter, but I also want to darken up this part a little bit. So what I'll do with curves 
go down in here, and that's where my background is. So what I'm doing is I'm dragging my mouse around here to get some preview. It looks like the background is right about there. So preview. That's what that little circle is, gives me a preview. So you can see I've already started dragging down the background here a little bit without, without really damaging the galaxy itself. So that's the background. I'll put another anchor point up here and start brightening some of the galaxy. That's starting to look pretty good. Maybe one more up here. So what I've done is I just put these anchor points and drag them with my mouse. And I think I'm satisfied with that for right now. So again, click this little X box here, or this little square down here, and that applies it. And I reset my settings. So that's what I've got. So that's where I am after levels and after curves transformation. This is, this is the image that I'm left with here. And I think that's pretty good. That's as good as I'm going to go for it for right now. So I'm going to save this image. We'll call it uh, Loom Stretch 3, right? Yeah, I'll just save it. The default settings for those saves are usually fine. Okay, so we've got we've got our luminance image, we cropped it, we took the background out of it, we stretched it. Now we're gonna do the same thing on color. So we go over to another workspace that I call RGB linear. We're gonna do the stretching on there. So I've got blue, green, and red already sitting here waiting for me to use them. And you can see this is the cropping icon that I sent over from when I used the cropping on the luminance frame. And the reason I have to use the same cropping icon is I gotta crop these colors the same way. But before I do that, I think I'm gonna go ahead and merge them. So let's merge our colors, kind of the same way we did in Photoshop. Here there's a tool called LRGB combination, a process. And uncheck that. And you enter in the names of your files over here. So one for red, one for green, one for blue. I'm not using luminance yet, so that's unchecked. I'm only combining red, green, and blue. And these are called, do you have the right names? I think I just have red, green, and blue. I have different names here. So you gotta make sure the names match up. Okay, so that should matter. And I click that little circle that applies it, and it starts combining the red, green, and blue, and it'll give us one color range. Okay, that's good. So there's our color image. I'm just gonna save my icon here again by grabbing the triangle, dragging and dropping, and releasing it on the screen. So if I ever wanted to go back to that that processing that I did, that color combination, I can get it. But now I've got one image. Let's get the preview, control A. So there's, there's our preview of our color image. See, it looks pretty much like it did in Photoshop, because we haven't done anything to it. But what we want to do is we want to crop it. So we go up to this cropping icon, and double click it, and it puts exactly the same crop out on this that it applied to the luminance data. So I just click the check mark to apply it. And now I've got a crop color image that's precisely lined up with my luminance image. So now I can put them together and I don't have to fiddle with getting them aligned. So now we've got, but remember, our image doesn't look like this, it looks like that still. So now we've got to stretch it. That's just the preview. So I'm going to save this. As RGB linear done, and three. So that saves it. And now we'll go over into the next workspace that I use, which is RGB stretching. So you may remember the image that we're starting out with. Here. 
Um, so there's the image that we're starting out with. And remember, it doesn't look like that. Control F12, it looks like that. So now we've got to start stretching it. So basically, the same way we stretched in Photoshop, the same way we stretched the luminance image here, curves, histograms. Mostly start with histograms. Ooh, wait, I'm sorry. There's one step that I have to do first. So let's go back to the preview. There's the preview. This is the, this is the problem I have with using the projector here, that all the notes that I've got on the right side of my screen here in PixInsight are all cut off by our projector. So I have to make it up on the fly. So the one thing that I want to go back to here before I do any stretching, but after I put the created the color image, you can go ahead and crop it first. That's fine. But now what I want to do is I want to fix these colors because the galaxies aren't supposed to be yellow. Stars aren't supposed to be green. They aren't supposed to look like this. And you remember in, in Photoshop, we went through and we struggled with the histogram tools to do the black points. And then we messed around with the curves to get the brighter parts. PixInsight has a tool called um, Photometric Color Calibration. Go up to Process. This is new. This is just in the last six months that they added this. Go up to Process and pick Photometric Color Calibration. And this dialog box will pop up. And I first looked at it and I was like, okay, I'm never going to be using this. Um, but the only thing that you really need here is this thing that says Search Coordinates. Click on that. And then it'll open up another box. And in that box, you can say, you can tell it what object you're looking at. The object that I'm looking at just happens to be M100. And so if I hit search, well, if I hit search here, it's going to come back and it's going to be unhappy because uh, I don't have an internet connection right now. But let's just do that. Okay. Living dangerously. I know. We can close now. I know. Warn. Okay, so now I go back up to the search coordinates and I enter in M100 and it reaches out to someplace in Strasbourg and it says, I find your target. Your object is M100 and its coordinates are X, Y, and Z. And then you just press this button that says get. And it will enter those in. <laughs> and now you have to enter in your focal length of your telescope and your pixel size, because it's, it's not going to be able to figure out what you're looking at unless it knows, you know, am I looking at this or am I looking at this? So Strasbourg wants a little bit of data from you, but if you, if you tell it your focal length and your pixel size, it knows what your image scale is. And then from that, it can do what's called a plate solve of your image in its database. And if you tell it, particularly if you tell it, I think I'm shooting M100, then it will come back within an instant and say, yes, you are. I did a plate solve for you. And in fact, I know the, uh, uh, I know the coordinates for your image. So now my coordinates have been entered. I'm going to close some of these because I can't screen real estate. It's a problem with the projector. Um, my coordinates have been entered. And all I do is I click this box for apply. And what it's going to do now for the next 30 seconds or so, it's going to go through and it's going to look at this image and it's going to compare it to the data it has over in Strasbourg. And it's going to find the stars in your image. And it's going to know this star ought to be that color. This star ought to be that color. This star ought to be that color. Uh, uh, star ought to be that color. Just down on the edge. And it's going to know what background should be. Background should be gray. And so once it's done all this cogitating, it's going to adjust all the colors, not just the darks, not just the levels the way we did in Photoshop, and not just the brights the way we had to do with curves. It's going to do all of them for you, and it's going to come back. It's going to give you this little output here, this little report that says, oh, okay, well, this is what I found. And as long as it's roughly, like, I believe, I've used this like four times so far, I believe as long as it's roughly linear, that means, yes, it worked. I'm fine. I'm happy with what you gave me. Um, I've tried to do this on stars, on narrowband images, too, and I think it can work. It's, it's trickier, but I think it can work. I just did one. It worked out? That's good. That's good. I've got to spend some more time on it. 
Yeah, so what you see here. So what what once you did this, then how did you how did you use that if I didn't. Oh, you had me used to This is my image. Notice how, notice how it's all yellow now? Yeah, oh, that's your preview. That's my preview, yeah. So if I let me see if I can change this. Yeah, so I just hit control F12 to, to, to turn off the preview, turn the preview back on, and that's what it is. So the thing is here, what this is telling you, you notice the galaxy is still yellow. It's not, it's not as yellow as it used to be, but what this is telling you is that I fixed your stars for you, buddy, but your data still sucks. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's, there's a workflow, you know, anybody who use pixels, I through a process where you do a background equalization and then you do a color calibration. Is this a replacement for that? Yes. Yes. All the stuff that you used to do with color calibration. It just made this whole three hours worth it. Maybe. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everything that you used to do with color calibration and background neutralization is gone. Okay. Do your background extraction first. Because you gotta you gotta try and rip yeah, yeah. some of the color the light right. pollution out of there. But once you've done that then do photometric color calibration, and it does all the work for you. Yeah, Chow told me about this a few sessions ago, and, and I was like, again, you know, anytime I see a new tool pop up in Pixel Insight, I'm like, oh, man. And, and I look at all the dials and settings and buttons, but then I just, you know, I just Googled somebody's explanation for it and realized that the explanation was click this, click that, click this. Don't, you know, blinders, don't, don't look at the rest of it. Don't look at the rest of it. And it works. It took me a while to make it work. You have to look very close to your whole lens, your yeah. computer size. Otherwise, you just run and run and eventually score the error so that you can find your Right. You, you have to tell it the focal length and the size of your pixels, mm -hmm. because from that it knows your image scale. Right. If it doesn't know your image scale, you could be shooting at one arc second per, per pixel, or you could be shooting at one degree per pixel. And it, it can, eventually it'll fail, it won't be able to play itself. But as long as you get your plate scale right, it, it will, I've never had any problem with running it at all. And I've run some pretty obscure targets through there too. Whatever its database is, you can, you can actually manually enter in the coordinates and then have it do a plate solve, but I've always been able to enter in my target name, and you know it, it knows what they are. Because I mean, this is a professional astronomy database, so as long as you're not using like you know Caldwell 12, you know, which is an amateur astronomy catalog, but I don't know, maybe it even knows what the Caldwell catalog is. I don't know. You can try it. Um, but as long as you're using some you know recognized naming system, it'll find your target. So it used the color of the stars to calibrate the color. Right. Your stars are not, or if your stars are oversaturated, that's obviously not going to work. Yeah, that's why you need to do this before you stretch. Okay. So this is still a linear image. Oh, Remember, gotcha. this is just a preview. The real image is that. So what it did was, it must do some, some analysis so it can actually find the stars in that image, because I'm only seeing one right now. It must have looked around, and when it gave me that chart at the end with the the, the, the points on it, I believe that those are the stars that it found. So, you know, I'm shooting galaxies out in the big empty, and it's probably only finding 20 or so stars. But when it finds 20 stars, it means I know what those stars are, what the colors are. And that's all you need. And you're saying it does adjust the background? It does, yeah. Yeah. I mean, for my background, I mean, my background sucks. But average, that background is gray right now. You can see, you can see that there are nice orange and blue and green splotches in it, but the average background is gray. So the, hopefully, hopefully you guys are not going to have to suffer through the shooting color images through light pollution the way I do, and it, and I definitely have better data than this. But again, you know, I I tried to bring the middle of the road data. Hopefully, you will do better than this and won't, won't run into the same kind of color blotchiness in the background that I do. We're, when we stretch here, I'll show you a rough and ready tool to, to deal with that. But yeah, hopefully, you won't have the same kind of problems that I have with color. Kevin, when you combine your RGB images, would you normally run dynamic background extraction on the individual channels before you combine them? 
No. No, because because um, my understanding is that dynamic background construction actually looks at each individual channel. So I just go ahead. That saves me from having to do it three times and set up three sets of you know, sample points and stuff like that. So I go ahead and I do the merge first and I crop too. But then I run BP. That's the next thing I do. So we're just going to save this. Is what when you're done three? Yes, we can write that. Good. And we're going to go over into our stretching workspace. No, we're already there. That's right, because I accidentally put it here first. Okay. So here we are with our uh, non-stretched image, because there it is. So now we're going to stretch pretty much the same way we did with the luminance. Start with histogram stretching. And we'll set out a preview. That's what the little circle does here. Set out a preview. Drag the center point way over and just barely see it. And click the square to apply it to the underlying image. And go back and reset our tool. Let's do it again. Oops, sorry, I want to see my Instagram. Boom, my Instagram is way up there. Okay, so I'm actually going to grab the black point because I want to darken down what I'm seeing here. And let me show you something. As I grab the black point and I slide it over, I'm starting to clip off some pixels, make them pure black. And PixInsight keeps track of that for me. So far, I've clipped 448 pixels. But since that's less than one, well, about 1 one hundredth of 1% 1 of my pixels, I'm okay with that. What happened when I dragged the slider over is I made the background blacker. Because it was just getting way too bright the way it was. Um, and as long as I'm not clipping off too much stuff, like I might even go up to a thousand or so. In theory, you know, you don't want to clip any pixels at all. But this is just my color. So I'm okay with that. So that's, I've got a nice dark background now. And now I'm going to grab my midpoint, my gray point slider. And I'm going to drag that over to start breaking things up. So that's good for this run. Set it back to, to neutral. And again, the next round. I'm going to darken up my background a bit. It's probably about as far as I want to go with that. Brighten it up a little bit more. Okay, that's probably good enough for histogram. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over into my levels, or into my curves tool. Close my preview. So that's what my data looks like right now. And I'm going to go over to my curves process. And I'm just going to do a final touch up of the stretching here. Okay, so yeah, once neutralize. Once you, that once puts my that, history. the histogram transformation. Uh, you're still, you still have a linear image. No. Once I have applied the histogram, I've stretched oh, it. Stretch and it's okay, no it's longer linear. linear. Yeah. Yeah. So you can still do the There's a lot of other processing that you can do, like the noise. And, and oh, yeah. Yeah. And I'm not going to go through any of the noise and convolution here. You know, we will definitely do that in future sessions. But I just wanted to you know, just do the yeah, basics yeah. for processing. Um, so this is just straightforward stretch. Where, where, I, where I would do those other advanced techniques. After the transformation or before? Uh, people argue uh, coherently and reasonably conflicting views. Um, they, they both seem reasonable. Um, I do some noise reduction when it's linear. I don't. I do more noise reduction after it's stretched, and I do sharpening both before and after as well. So yeah, it just it just depends on the data. A lot of people they say strongly you ought to do it one way or the other. But I mean, generally, if if I find whoa, it's really hard doing it that way, but the other way it seems to work pretty well. <laughs> That's the way I do it. Um, so here we're just still stretching. What I want to do is I want to pull down some of the background, just a little bit in curves. So you know, I'll grab over here, which is mostly from, sorry, let me set up in preview. I'll grab over there. So that's what I started with. I'll grab over here where the dark stuff is and start dragging it down a little bit. And then I'll pull up here, keep my galaxy bright. That's pretty good. I'm pretty satisfied with that. We said it. So that's what it looks like right now. Still got my preview over here, but that's what it looks like. 
Um, now, last step in stretching my color, I want to get it more colorful because it's kind of gray right now, right? And especially once I combine it with the gray luminance image, that color is not going to go away. So what I'm going to do is we've been stretching using this part, the RGBK uh, aspect of stretching, which means you're stretching all the colors at the same time. What I want to do is I want to increase the, just the saturation, which is the S over here. So I click on S for saturation, and now I've got a saturation curve here. And all this does is it boosts the saturation of the image. So you can see how the saturation is starting to come up. And I don't really want it to come up in the background, and I can try and pull it down, but I generally find that doesn't help that much. You know, and it makes, it makes it tough for me to get what I want. So in general, I just delete those points. In general, I just grab the saturation curve and, and pull it up in the middle. Can I do the saturation curve again? Oh, there it is. The saturation curve is the, the S down here. Whereas normally what you use if you use RGBK, control all the colors at the same time. So I've got the I've got the saturation up about where I want it. A tiny bit more. Okay, that's good. I like that. And so that applied it. There it is. But you know, I'd still like this a little bit more blue, I think. And I'd like some this is a little too yellow. <laughs> so now I can just work on blue. So I just pick the blue slot or the blue control, and I'll just boost it a little bit. I don't want to go too far. And I want to pull the background down so the background doesn't all turn blue. There it is. Probably can't get anybody better than that. Alright, so I just click the click the square again to apply it. Set my tool. That's good enough. That's, that's about the best I'm going to get. Uh, one last trick that I might try and apply here with curves is to deal with all the ugly stuff in the background. So I don't really want to have blue blotches and yellow blotches and red blotches. I'd like to try and get rid of those. There are ways that you can do that at the end, after you've got your final image, you can, that's what I was talking about, extracting the background, making an artificial flat, and that's the best way to do this, but that's complicated. You can do a quick and dirty method, which is, I go back to RGBK, and I reset my tool, and I click here to show my histogram. So I can see that's where everything is. And usually, the peak of the histogram means that's where the black is, right? So what I can do is, I can just grab that black point. Show me preview again. I can just grab that black point, and this is this is black because I'm way over on the left end of the histogram, so it's only controlling the dark parts of the image. So if I grab that black point and I drag it down, and then adjust the histogram elsewhere to keep the galaxy and the stars themselves bright and saturated. Then I can kind of cheat this. It's not perfect, but it's a lot better than it would have been. And I still have some color in the galaxy. I still have some blue where I want it. And maybe I even want, let's apply this for right now. So that's what I've got now. Maybe I even want to put a little bit more blue in there in the galaxy itself. So blew up the galaxy. Yeah, you can see I'm torturing the color data here to make this happen. Um, but again, that's because I shut up, shoot through crappy light polluted skies. Uh, and you know, with more effort, you will you will do the curves, uh, particularly for adjusting colors, the way that uh, gives you the best result. But for right now, let's just go with this, and I'll show you how to put all your colors together with your luminance data. We'll save this uh, as stretch three. Good enough. Okay, we'll go over the final final workspace, which the one I'm using here is LRGB. 
So that's what when we put luminance together with our RGB images. So I open up the final luminance, which was stretch three, and I open up the final color, which was also RGB stretch three. So now I've got my two images. I want to put them together with a tool in processes called, uh, we used this before, LRGB combination. So before we used it to combine the red, green, and blue data. But here we're doing something entirely different. Here we're going to put the luminance data on top of the color. So I uncheck red, green, and blue to, sorry, to deactivate them. And I leave luminance active. I gotta make sure that the, the name of the, the, the image is correct. So I'm gonna edit this. Loom stretched three, right? And so all I have to do at this point is I drag, I take this little little triangle, and instead of saving it like this, as if I wanted to, to, to save the icon, um, I can drag it and drop it onto the image. Um, in this case, actually, I, I, I'm realizing I think I can still just apply click apply global. So let's go ahead and do that. And what it's doing is it's adding the luminance image into the color data, the same way we did it in Photoshop, it just, you know, this does all the work for you. It also, because this is PixInsight, and it's, that didn't really get us much there. So you see it's still, it's still not having much color. So what we're going to do, we're going to pull. See, the see this transfer functions thing here with lightness and saturation? We can actually increase the saturation. Now, counterintuitively, to increase the saturation in PixInsight, you drag down the slider. So I'm going to drag it down to 0.3. That's probably good enough, but let's just press the button and find out. Oh, you know what I'm doing? I'm sorry, I made a mistake here. I do need to, I do need to take this triangle and drag and drop it because it didn't know where I was going. Okay, that's what I did wrong. So, it, see, I, I've told it what, what luminance image to use, but I did not tell it what to use for red, green, and blue because I've got it. Those are all already assembled here. So instead, and I'm going to leave the, the saturation on neutral for right now, which is 0.5. Instead, what I do is I grab this triangle. And I, what I'm doing really is I'm dropping the luminance image onto the color image. So let it go. And now we'll start putting it together. And hopefully now we'll actually get a good color image out of it. Or at least a, a good color image out of it. That's better. So you can see now we've actually got color. Now admittedly, those stars are way too orange for me. And you can see that there's blotchiness in here. And you can see color blotches in blue up on top. If we had spent more time um, stretching our colors the right way and setting our levels in exactly the right, right way and devoted, devoted more energy to it, then we might have been able to avoid the, the blotchiness in the background here. But my experience with this data was that the, the colors came out fine. The galaxy color and the star colors came out fine. But I still wound up with a lot of this blotchiness in the background. And my solution was, which we're not going to cover here because it's pretty advanced, is to take it back into Photoshop and make an artificial flat for it. It's a lot of work. And I've been doing it that way for years. <clears throat> because before I was using PixInsight, I had to do that with every picture I ever took. And it can take a couple hours. And it was really, really hard. But then when I started using PixInsight, remember dynamic background extraction, that tool that we showed you how to, at the very beginning to, to get all the ugliness out of the background? That now does 90% of the work for me. And most of the time, I don't wind up with an image like this that still has blotchiness in the background. What was the question? No, I ran, I ran it on the luminance too. If I didn't, I certainly meant to. Okay, you ran, I saw you ran did I not run it on the color? Okay, so you guys have caught me in a mistake, which probably explains why when I ran this earlier today, I got... I 
use that result for my luminance, and when I put this on top of it, Okay, when I put, when I used this image that I processed earlier today, which I did do background extraction on, I think you're going to see a better result, I hope. Yeah, well this is stretched a little bit more too. So here's the comparison. Yeah, this one, this one is definitely less ugly. And the stars, the stars are still better. Okay, so, yes, thank you, Linda. So, you're supposed to do digital dynamic background extraction on your luminance to get out your luminance gradients, but especially do it on your RGB image. Go ahead and put your images together first. Put your red, green, and blue together into an RGB image. Go ahead and crop it. But then run dynamic background extraction on it because you're, if you think your, your gradients are bad in your luminance image, if you're shooting through light pollution with LRGB filters, it's nothing like the gradients that you'll get in, uh, uh, in, color, in color data. So yeah, that's exactly what happened here. Um, now you can see though that there is, there's still a few little differences. Like here, if you look at the background galaxy, here it's a more neutral color, whereas here it's very red and it really shouldn't be. Here, I've got more blue in the spiral arms, whereas here, they're, they're pretty, pretty pale out and, you know, and neutral. But those are the kind of things that hopefully you guys won't run into if you're shooting through dark skies. You won't have the same kind of trouble that I have. Uh, also, you know, once you start taking more time with the stretching, you do, particularly with the color stretching, you will run into, you will run out with a, a better end result. So the end result that I got after I did put in all the extra effort. Here, let me just pull it back from the internet. I actually did some more modification on it the other day because I realized it looked too yellow. The final image I came out with was that. And you can see that all the, the ugly gradients are gone. Um, the galaxy is mostly blue, the way it should be. Um, the core of the galaxy, which was like yellowish green the first time I posted it on the email list, hopefully now is a more neutral tone. But again, this was all with more advanced tools and picks insight. If you are trying to get your first image, do it the way we did it here. And then come back to our next session and ask somebody, how can I improve on the image that I've got already? Um, I think we can probably hang around here for a little while for, for some questions. Um, so, but that's the, that's the basic steps. I mean, this is, this is how you get, if not to that, it's how you get, you know, to a result like this, that then with some further work, you can do some extra work on it, and you can you can get it up to the, the picture that you want it to be. But I can tell you that the real difference that you're seeing here is stretching. Stretching is complicated, and stretching is done in different ways, and you can agonize over stretching. And stretching, particularly when you're stretching color, it's tricky, and you got to stretch it in the right way. Uh, the way to know if it's right is if you're satisfied with the photo in the end. But it's the kind of thing that with practice you will get better at and you will get more pleasing photos to, to your, for yourself. Also, then you'll be able to go back and reprocess the data once you've figured out how to do it the right way. Uh, so that, that's pretty much the, the end of the presentation we had, Image Processing 101. Um, if you guys want to hang out, I think nobody's pounding on the door just yet, so even though we've gone past our timeline, uh, hopefully we'll have more time to, uh, to, to talk about uh, other techniques. Okay?